Hi, this is a Disco Inferno. I'm a former WCW TV champion. I'm a former WCW Cruiserweight champion. I was also a former booker on the WCW writing team. And I'm about to do an interview for Hannibal TV. I'm gonna do a little dance, make a little love, and get down tonight. Boom. What was your childhood like? Um, I was a uh, only child, so um, I grew up playing, play, played all, every, all, all the sports except for baseball. I wasn't playing baseball. I played soccer, basketball, and football growing up. I was a good soccer player. Um, that was my like sport of choice. I was one of the better um, better soccer players in the state of Georgia. I grew up in Atlanta. I was born born in Brooklyn, but I moved there when I was three years old. So I grew, grew up in suburban Atlanta, Georgia, Marietta. And uh, played soccer. I was a good soccer player. We weren't actually a traveling team that went that represented uh, the state of Georgia that went to England. And I was like a, when I was 12 years old. So I, I, I peaked uh, athletically when I was 12. Um, when I got into high school, uh, I started going to a private school and the drive was like f like a 40 minute drive back back and forth to, to school so i just like uh practice and stuff and you know like sports was kind of like different than when you're doing that when as opposed to when you're playing in your neighborhood and stuff and all that uh so like athletically i just in high school I just played soccer and like one year of football i played soccer and just i just kind of like got disinterested in in uh in the organized sports so i played a lot of pickup like a lot of intramural stuff and everything but um and I was always interested in uh, in pro wrestling. That was like my favorite show to watch on TV. Um, I was a good kid in uh, the, the, the like perfect attendance in school. Maybe I missed like three days my entire school like history. I just, I, I've never been been gotten sick. Oh. I've always been like I, you can count on probably five fingers the amount of days I've been sick in like the past like thirty years. You know, I just I'm not uh, sick to me is you can't get out of bed. You know. Yeah. And uh, so I just was always like healthy. Um, Parents were uh, um, to three three Scorpios, three Italians, living under one roof. So we kind of like argued with each other a lot, like typical like, Italian family. Um, ended up going to college. Uh, went to uh, failed out of Georgia Tech twice. So I wasn't a good. I wasn't a good student. I was. I was I'd like to go play sport, play, play pickup and stuff and everything. And just go out all the time. Uh, then I went to like a um, like over, over a year of. Uh, um, what do you call it? like vocational schools and then I went to uh, then I went to University of Georgia for three and a half years and when I finished there uh, the week I got out the week I graduated I tried out for wrestling okay so I went to six and a half years of college yeah. the week I tried out for wrestling got like made, did the tryout and never looked back Oh, okay. Like my entire college, six, six, if I, I would have known I was going to be a professional wrestler, yeah. I would have not have got, done, done six and a half years of college. It was a six and a half year window of my life that was just been a complete waste of time. So Before you get into your, your wrestling trial, like what wrestling were you exposed to in Atlanta? At, at everything. So, so Atlanta was like, it's, here's the best part. Like if you, if you grew up in Atlanta, and during, during what I did, and you were a professional wrestling fan, it was very difficult to not like know a lot about the business because we had... <clears throat> In uh, 1979, cable, cable TV started. So I was getting, obviously, the Superstation on WTBS in Atlanta, 6 o'clock on Saturday nights. Uh, so then um, we got cable. And when cable started, I was getting WR in New York and USA Network. And WR back then would show, of course, the weekly WWE or WWF wrestling back then. But they would also show USA Network once a month would show Wrestling from the Garden, Madison Square Garden. Okay. So I was watching all that, and then in Atlanta on channel 36, it was kind of like a like a substation. It wasn't like you know, like one of the major networks. But uh, on channel 36, this guy named Joe Pettacino had a show. Um, it was like Saturday Night Wrestling. He had from eight o'clock at night till three o'clock in the morning, an hour from seven different parts of the country. Okay, wow. so I was exposed to, and I watched everything. I did, taped it on my VCR recorder if I wasn't home and stuff and everything. So I seven plus. Uh, two, nine, ten, ten, ten to thirteen hours a week of wrestling that, that I would watch for six, seven, eight years in a row. Just like I just got like educated to the like wrestling, seen a lot of like from different like they had you know AWA wrestling, wrestling from um you know Mid South wrestling, Bill Watts's. Uh, sometimes they had Florida wrestling. They'd wrestle in the Northeast. Sometimes they show Puerto Rico. You know the the, the, the seven hours of local wrestling stuff, but of uh, the thing I always used to become, I was interested in, was like the, the storylines, characters. So you're watching 10 to 13 hours of wrestling each, each week, and I had most of it on the VCR. 
I would, you know, watch all the interviews and kind of like, you know, fast forward through the matches, get to the finish, see what was going on. So, you know, to speed it up. Like, I wasn't watching, you know, 13 full hours unless like it was, it was a good match. I want to see the whole match. But uh, I was just mainly interested in the storylines, interviews, and, and, and who was winning, you know. But that kind of like... Um, Shaped, shaped me kind of like a, as like kind of a student of wrestling because it's very difficult not to be a student when you're watching that much wrestling. You know, just getting it's it's, it's like wrestling today. People watch it, they become student, they, they learn about it. You know, so yeah. Is there any favorites that you had in particular? Yes, uh, I used to. My favorite show used to be Mid South Wrestling um, with uh, the, the Bill Watts stuff with because um, I thought I, at the time I thought, I thought Jim Ross was like like the the best announced. Like he was like all fired up and uh, um, but I liked growing up. I was a big Dusty Rhodes fan, big Four Horsemen fan, uh, big um, you know, Macho Man Hogan, uh, Piper, with Piper and Honky Tonk. Those were kind of like my favorites growing up. And me and my friends, uh, we used to go to the Omni in Atlanta and watch wrestling. We were kind of like those, um, you know, kind of back then smart marky type guys. We, we, we knew wrestling was, was a work, but we didn't know how they did it like everybody does today. But uh, we used to wear like, you know, wear blazers and stuff and everything. Go ahead and we, we cheer the horsemen. You know, there's always like a there's always a contingent of four horsemen fans in, in the crowd at the Omni. Like maybe 15 to 20 percent of the crowd was always you know woo. They do the other. They'd always do the fingers. They were heel fans, and uh, that that was like um that that's what I grew up on. Just the you know, I got to see like you know Miss Wrestling Number Two, the Assassins, Buzz Sawyer and Tommy Rich. You know their their wars wars they had uh, um the Omni was a uh, you know back then. The Omni was like one of the hottest, you know, buildings for wrestling. It was just, <clears throat> it just seemed like it, it was so different. Like, like then, like th there was always fights in the crowd. Oh, really? I mean, always fights in the crowd. Five, six fights a night. It was just, you know, a lot of, you know, there was, there was good emotion in, in the arena. You know, back then, everybody thought wrestling, you know, the suspension disbelief was still in the right place. A lot of people thought it was real. You know, yeah. back then, and uh, and there was always a lot of fights. We almost got in fights because we were fans of the horse. We, you know, fans, fans spit on us sometimes. You know, we, we cheered the uh, cheer the horsemen and stuff. But uh, but that's what I, I that's what I grew up with. And that that those were my favorites. Piper and Piper's Pit were probably like my favorite things growing up to, to watch. Okay, so you preferred the heel side. Um, I, I prefer the guys that could that could that could cut good promos. Okay. You know, just just I, I thought Piper was just a, you know, but the guys that could talk. I just. Yeah, and I was like, I kind of gravitated toward, but I like Dusty. You know, right. Dusty who, who didn't like Dusty? It was, it was hard to be a heel fan and not like Dusty Rhodes because yeah. he was so charismatic. His interviews were so good. You know. So you always wanted to be a wrestler, obviously, and then not really, not not really. No, no uh, I just always wanted, like, 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 was a fan of wrestling. Okay. I didn't really, I didn't really know what I wanted to do, but I had a I had a friend of mine, uh, my soccer coach growing up was a travel agent, and um, this guy was my soccer coach for like ten years. And if still friends of our family to this day. Like, we, if I'm ever in town, we always go to their house for like it's a holiday dinner and stuff. But uh, he was a travel agent, and he was do, booking the travel for the NW the NWA. But he was working with Ole Anderson and stuff at back at that time. And when I'd finished college, he asked me, you know, he just said this had never been discussed before. He said, do you want to try out to wrestle? I was like, yeah, I guess so. I'll try. You know, I, I wasn't really. I was in decent shape because I'd started working out when I was 21 years old, but I was always like, you know, an athlete. I played sports, played street hockey, played basketball, I played everything. But uh, I, 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 my body was like, all right, you know, I was like probably 200 pounds, and I, I tried out. He you know, got me a tryout, and I just I, I passed the tryout and never looked back. Did he ever have any issues with Ole Anderson booking travel, or was Ole pretty normal to him? Uh, he. Oli was always cool to him because he had a deal with, with he he um, had gotten with Oli and had 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 a deal with Oli. This is back when with Sky Models were kind of like a, a like a new thing. Yeah. And they would book the travel, and Oli would get all the Sky Models for the guys. <laughs> so he loved my friend, my, my dead my coach because they they had like a, I don't want to use words to say it's a scam, but but they had a, a, a kind of a racket set up where where Oli was getting all the Sky Miles. You know, like with all the travels because he was like, you know, he was, he was a booker, you know, so so he loved that, you know, he, he never never had, they, they never had any issues, you know, they, they were always cool with each other, you know. So what was your actual training like? Um, I, me and my friends used to like, we, of course we were wrestling fans, so we used to play wrestling in the yard and stuff, you know, not in the yard, to get, to get the kid's house. So I always used to, I, I could throw a good working punch already, you know. 
I, I got lucky. I, I, the Bill Eady was the guy that was running the school, but he never trained me. There was a guy named Steve the Brawler Lawler, a uh, really good indie worker, you know, and stuff. I think he, if, he had probably like pursued it more and everything. He probably, probably he, he could have easily worked on, on TV and worked against anybody. He's, he's a good worker. But I, I got lucky. I picked it up really, really, really fast. And I, the, the luckiest thing I did was, is I hit the ropes. Uh, the, the first time I, I hit the ropes, I hit the ropes right the, the first time I tried it. And just, I, so the ropes and the bumps just, I, I just was just, uh, for some reason, you know, when you try them the first time, it's like, hey, this, the, you're doing it right. I, I was doing those right. And uh, I trained twice a week uh, for five weeks and then I gave them the money and I, I don't know whether they thought I was ready or not or whether they were just like, you know, they, they got my money and they were like, okay, we're, we're done with you. But like, they, that's okay. they said, okay, you're ready. You know, after they got all the money, but like I, I kind of, I was super green, you know. But back then, uh, you know, there weren't, there, there was, there, there were no territories. This was around 90, 92. Um, there were no territories, but this was a lot of indie work. But I remember, like my first match, I, I worked and I gave an envelope, and I opened up and there was, <laughs> said they got an envelope. It's like there was no money in it, you know. So oh, really? <laughs> yeah, that was my first match of the day. They got, I got an envelope. My envelope was an envelope. That's what I made. So I, I tell people this day, like, hey, what'd you get? What was your envelope? They're like, oh, forty bucks. Like, You're lucky. I, I just got the envelope, you know. So, but, uh, but back then I was making you know twenty to forty dollars uh, doing indies, but I was, um, I, I was green, you know. I just, you, you, you go back and look. The funniest thing is when you look, when you when you're watching yourself, like you tape, you, somebody records you, you watch, and you think you're pretty good. Then you, you wrestle another year or two, and you go back and look back at the other two. It's like, oh my god, I, I thought I was good back then. It's like you know, it's, it's, but uh, I just started um, you know do, doing the indies and improving as I worked better workers. You know, when you're working other indie workers, you just you really don't know what you're doing. A lot of times too, but back then, th there was still the deal where uh, we had to call it in the ring sometimes. Right. You know, there was, there was a lot of indie shows I would go to, we'd heal in baby dressing room, you knew you wouldn't talk. You know, the referee would just come and give you the finish and you go, you go meet out there and stuff. But, so I kind of, you know, learning that way was a lot, you know, you, you pick it up a lot faster, learning how to work and call things in the ring. It wasn't like when I got to WCW and like, you know, we, we sit in the back and basically lay out the match because you have time and stuff, but like, I, I was like kind of the last breed of wrestlers, I guess, maybe the early 90s that <clears throat> I tell people to this day is like, you know, when, when, I, when I, I, until I got, I started training to wrestle, I'd, I'd never seen an observer or a pro wrestling torch until like a couple of the guys from the, that were training with would bring them. And I'd read it like, you know, I'm reading like the inside stuff. And like, you know, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know how they did it. You know, I, there was no, unless you had the pro wrestling torch or the observer, you didn't know the inside stuff of wrestling, just watching on TV. And like, that's the early 90s. So it's like, that's kind of like the last era of when we, you know, before like the internet started and people like started, you know, like then the Monday Night War started and everybody kind of like became interested. But like, you know, I, I learned to work, I learned to work in the ring and call stuff. You know, like that's the first thing we did was like when we're, we're training, they're not just telling us, you know, we're, we're training, call, call the moves, you know, stuff and everything. So then that, that, that's how I learned. You know? Did Bill E.D. end up giving you any advice? Because I guess he was fresh. Yeah, and well, not, he didn't, yeah, but most of my advice came with Bill traveling with him on indie shows okay. and that knowledge in the car. You know, so he was a brilliant, I, I love traveling with him because he, has, he was a great storyteller. He had great stories too. Because you know, he had a really interesting past. You know, this guy's kind of like a muscle for some guys, you know, like, like, like a debt collector type you know, so, like, so he was, uh, he always was telling me like all these stories, you know, growing up at a, and he would like just, you know, just psychology, pro wrestling psychology and stuff. And just, um, you know, a lot of people really don't know exactly what that, that means. You know, like, like what is psych psychology? Everybody use that word psychology, you know, stuff. But uh, until you like, until you, like when you don't know what it is, until you have somebody like explain stuff to you in wrestling, like that's what it is. You know, it's like, like if you have bad psychology, so you really don't know a lot of how to work. You talk to guys that have worked for years and they just kind of tell you how to work. That's how, that's like psychology to me, you know? And I just learned a lot from him. And I used to drive around a lot, a lot with Jake Roberts. I had to pick him up and we always had to go on these wild rides, you know, with him. <laughs> it's like with your Jake, it's like, you, know, you never know where. Those were his dark days. Oh yeah, yeah, it's just, he's just a mess. But like in between of him being a mess on these trips, I'd have to go with him and stuff. I think he'd, you know, just, just give me great knowledge. How to work a character, how to do, you know, just what what to do, and go, go try this, try this, try this. I, I go and try it, go and try it. He, you know, and stuff. But he was always like, 
I mean, he'll, he'll even tell you these stories. He, he was a crackhead. Right. You know, we'd go, we'd be driving. Hey, hey, pull over this town over here, you know? We'd go down the highway, like, we're like four hour drive. You just pull into town and go try and find the hood in the town and pull up to street quarters, ask people if they got any crack. <laughs> I'm, I'm, trying, I'm a great guy in the business, right? You know, I've known him from seeing him on TV and so You know what I'm like? I'm, this is crazy. I'm like, I went to private school. You know what I'm school? So I'm not like a suburban kid from you know, Marietta, Georgia, and stuff. And I'm driving around with Jake, and he's trying to, you know, he's like, you know, he, he, he was a crackhead back then. You know, he just couldn't. And I would have to go and drive him and stuff. You know, I didn't do it. You know, I have to drive. So it's like, you know, I'm the driver. I'm the green guy driving around Jake, and he's, you know. <sighs> But but in between all that, the guy the guy's brilliant, you know, for for wrestling. But it's just, just he was just a mess, you know. Right. But uh, do it right in the car. Yeah, just, you know, <laughs> it's funny. He was like, you know, <clears throat> we like, we get in the car and I I get in the driver's seat and like you know he would get in the passenger seat. But his, his car, I drive, we drive his car. He don't want do want to drive because he want to like you know, and he would always like you know just reach in like pull the can out and be like. You know, I haven't done this since the last time I drove with you. <laughs> Every time, and I'm like, oh, yeah, dude, all right, yeah, sure, Jake. You know, I'm sure, I'm sure that's true. You know, I <laughs> said, so, oh, really? So, so he like, you know, he do that. And then I, uh, so I was doing that with him. Plus, I had to drive with the Sheik a lot. Oh, I, the I, oh yeah, Sheik yeah, the Iron no, the Iron Sheik. Sheik. Okay. Iron Sheik. You know, I had to drive with him. That was a, those were always wild rides. You know, because he just liked to, he liked to smoke pot and drink. Right. You know, he's driving the car, and he would always, he, he was hysterical too, because he would. Uh, He'd, he'd always wear his gear, just like all the, he'd, have to, he'd wear the boots with the, with the toe stick, and I'm like, you know, I'd, I'd pick him up in the car, and would, you know, it's what he'd be wearing. Yeah. And I'd, I'd go to his, he had a nice house in the suburbs in, in South South Atlanta. His wife, his wife was a, like a banker, uh, three you know, good looking daughters, and he had a, um, I'd always have to go pick him up his house, and he'd have a, um, <clears throat> oh, like, a like a gym in his backyard. But it was funny because like you know, he did the gym would be in the backyard, but he didn't like cover the weights or nothing, you know. So I mean, all the equipment was all rusty, you know. Because it rained on it, just like it was, so. It's like, but he'd be out there working out, and I'd come pick him up. Hey, ready to go? She sure. He'd be like doing bench press and stuff, and uh, we would always have to um, <clears throat> we'd always have to go like the first thing we do, we have to go to the liquor store, and he would buy a um, like how how would I put this? Like like the largest amount of liquor whatever it was that you could buy for the cheapest price like you know per fluid house you would get like you know like these bottles like mad dog which is like like the worst liquor you could drink these, these, these big bottles of it you know and he'd, he'd uh he'd getting just he would just drink and smoke pot you know on, on the on the drive and you know i didn't do that you know <laughs> i'm the driving the green guy driving around you know but like but it was funny we'd always drive uh atlanta to birmingham and um what was, what was this place called uh Metter, Alabama, or something like that. This is a town, Moultrie, Alabama. Okay, and Moultrie, Alabama was uh, you, you drive uh, due west out of Atlanta and then d straight north to, to a Moultrie in the Bur going to Birmingham, right? So back then, um, we would do the drive like I, I was driving him six, seven times. I drove with him, same drive. Uh, but in between, when when you go from Birmingham north towards Moultrie, there um. There would, there would be dry counties in Alabama where they don't serve alcohol, right? So it would be funny, you'd be driving and like there'd be like, a, you'd hit the dry county, but you're, you're driving on the highway and there'd be billboards kind of like Vegas lit up, you know, beer, five miles, you know, like, like hey, they're letting you know, alcohols in the next exit and stuff. So when I used to go, <laughs> I used to go with the Sheik, after the show, it was a routine, right? We we leave the show and we be the show was in a dry county. So when we leave the show, he want to go get beer for, for the trip home, and we have to drive like right six seven miles down the highway to the ne to the next county to to get the the, the first exit get the beer right. So we always every time every time we get in the car like first first two or three trips, hey maybe we get beer after the show you know stuff and maybe we go back get some beer sure sure she yeah, can we'll get beer we we'll get beer and I do it you know see the sign five miles two miles next exit pull off and get the beer right. So it was funny but like the be three or four exits in that county, it'd be beer off every exit. So I started like doing it, like he'd do the same thing, hey, maybe we get beer after the show, like it was a good routine, right? Yeah. So, so I started going, so now like next exit, you know, beer five miles, beer two miles, beer. So I was like joking, joking around. I'd be like, I'd, I'd drive right by the exit, right? And he'd be like, 
what the fuck? Hey, you jabroni, you like to start yelling at me. Oh, Sheik, I'm sorry. Like, you'd be telling me the whole time. Hey, maybe we get better. I, I, I act like I'm stupid. Like, I just try passing and go, ah, oh, geez, she been. I, I, maybe we'll get down the road, it'll be some, you know, and then pull off the next essay, buy a beer. But we did that routine like three or four times <laughs> in a row. I'd pull the same rib on him. He would fall for it every time, pitch the same fit, I would just pull off the next exit. You know, so it was, just, it was a trip. We I mean, did it in the car. When, when I would pick him up, he would tell me the Hulk Hogan story like every time he picked me up, I'd pick him up. Like he forgot he'd tell me the, 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 the previous time. And there would be some trips we'd take, we, we would go down to like Pensacola and stuff and I'd be with the chief for like two days, you know? Two, three days. And he liked to go, he didn't like to pay. For, for, for food, when we stopped the food, he thinks he's the Iron Sheik, I don't have to, I don't pay, you know? Just figure he always had a, a, a bag of autographed pictures, or just pictures, and he would just like, hey, uh, they hit a picture, you know, food is free, you know? So it's, it's, he thinks like he's leaving an autographed picture for the Sheik, just get everything free, and I'd be like, Jesus Christ, you know, I'd, I'd have to pay for it. You know, I'm not gonna leave, I'm not gonna drive away and have the cops come and go for like, you know what I'm saying? I'm not, yeah. I was still, you know, I'm still like an educated guy. Like, you know, I got to see, just, you know, she, we can't just leave and not pay. You know, they may call the cops and they, they see what we're driving, you know, so. Uh, but he the, he would do that and he would just, he wouldn't want to pay for drinks. He'd always just give people the autograph pictures. But the, the, the funniest thing is he would always, like, if we were at a, um, we were on the beach in Pensacola one time uh, because we had a day off. We're down there and, like, we had to drive just, just an hour drive. So we go to, like, oh, she can want to go to the beach before the show? Sure. So he would be on the beach, you know, with, with his, you know, the, the, oh, the boots and everything. Yeah, we'll walk, walk around the back and just walking up to people. And this, this is how he'd do it. Like, this was his routine. He'd have pictures with them. He saw people recognize him. He would say, hey, hey I give you a picture. And, you know, you give me a dollar for charity. He only wanted a dollar back then. That's like he got this picture. Hey, maybe give me a dollar for charity. You know, that's <laughs> just what he'd say, you know. So people would, like, you know, he'd just hand him a picture and be all right. You know, <laughs> reach in your pocket and give him a dollar. So the funny thing to say is like, so we go to the beach one day and then she's got his, his, his things up there, you know, there's people walking around like bikinis and bathing suits and, and she's walking up and like, hey, give me a picture, you know, <laughs> they give her a dollar for charity. People have like their, their bathing suits. They're like, yeah. and, and she, I have no money. She, you know? <laughs> and so the funniest thing was one day, he would always go, hey, give me give me a dollar for charity. Here, give me a dollar for charity. So one day, like, was a, I'll never forget, it was a guy, three kids, you know, family, like husband and wife and stuff. And he goes, hey, did you give a picture for charity? Give me a uh, dollar for charity? And the guy goes, what charity is this? And she like, has this look on his face like, uh, 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 Oklahoma City bombing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, it's like that's what the, the 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 charity chic would say. Like you know, like yeah. hey, you're giving to the Oklahoma City bombing charity. Like you know, <laughs> he was just keeping the money, of course. You know, so yeah. <laughs> Jesus, that's crazy. Yeah. So what gimmick did you do when you started wrestling? Well, they did this stupid thing with me. That was uh, when I was my first when I trained. Um, they had a they had a TV show called North Georgia Championship Wrestling. Right, that's where I trained. It's Alfred Auction Bar and this little you know typical indie stuff. You know. So. And uh, they made me, um, they did TV taping and they, they called me the, the, the slave. And I came out with like this manager lady, this, this lady, I even forgot what her name was, but this lady manager would have me like, I'd be like a, a Roman slave. I had like the slave. <laughs> so that, was, uh, that lasted one TV taping, right? So then I became the, uh, the Brooklyn stud. Uh, and my, my, my name's Glenn Gilberti, right? But the show had a, um, this guy, named, his name was Sammy Kent, right? And he, uh, and he, um, he, he was, he, he's passed, you know, but he was, he was illiterate, you know, he couldn't really read and write that good, right? So he was, but he was the announcer on the TV show. And so my debut match, like it says, you know, I had my name is Glenn Gilberti, they're just going to have me wrestle with my, my real name, right? And he goes, uh, we got the kid making his debut, he's going to be Glenn Gilbernetti, he's going to be, the, they call me Glenn Gilbernetti right. on TV. Everybody thought my name was Glenn Gilbernetti from that day forward because that's the first time he said it on TV. <laughs> you know, Wrestling Observer would say Glenn Gilbernetti, you know, blah, blah, blah. so I was Glenn Gilbernetti, you know? So I was like the Brooklyn stud, Glenn Gilbernetti. That's what I started just calling myself because that's what everybody was calling me, you know? But my name was Gilberti, you know, but and that would have just been Glenn Gilberti, you know, but they just mispronounced my name. So I was the Brooklyn stud, Glenn Gilbernetti, and then I did a, a gimmick called the... Uh, the uh, the the um, what would we call it? the uh, 
like a chip and death. I can't forget the bot squad. Okay, me and me and another guy, um, uh, Ashley Clark. He was a he was a good good, good worker too. He ended up being a uh, he went on another tag team called the Convicts, but uh, but me and him were the bot squad. Glenn Glenn Gilbernetti, uh, the be uh, gorgeous Glenn, and Bodacious Blade, the bot squad. So it's a typical indie gimmicks, you know, like for, for a couple years. But then I. Uh, uh, I graduated. I, I'd met Ray. I knew Raven back then, and like we were hanging out, like and stuff, and everything. And then, you know, he we brainstormed, and then he came up with the, with the Disco Inferno gimmick. Okay. And I just started like I really wasn't doing it. Yeah, you know, I was just like, hey, this is an idea for a gimmick. And so he got me booked in Memphis. Raven was working in Memphis at the time uh, to do the Disco Inferno gimmick. So I went, but, but they like called me like, hey, could you be, do, it's like a Wednesday, you know, can you do TV, come to Memphis to do TV Saturday, or do, do, do you want the Disco Inferno? It's like, oh shit, I don't even have any outfit, you know, I had to go buy, I had to go to a thrift store and just buy some makeshift stuff to put on, you know, to do the, to do the gimmick. And if you ever see the, the video, there's a video out there on YouTube, it's, it's, it's funny, you know, it's my debut, like him introducing me in Memphis, you know, stuff and, uh, and it was just ridiculous. I looked, by the way, I looked like a disco guy, you know, just like a, a cheesy, 70s disco character and um and i started doing that and i worked in memphis for like five weeks and I, I was still green you know it wasn't that good but i was all right you know wasn't bad but uh they just, they just didn't didn't use me anymore so i thought maybe that okay that gimmick is no good you know so i just quit doing that gimmick again i think i became i was the brooklyn stud glenn gilbernetti again on indie shows and stuff but like you know but at that time wrestling was just like you know how it is on the indies like you're trying to make it, but you're you're in that no man's land sometime where you're just you're just doing indie work and you're not making a lot for your matches. You're just learning and you're trying to figure things out. And that that's what I was doing back then. And uh, until they had found, like Paige knew Jake, and like it, you know the, the, that's when I started hanging with this. Hey, you need to, you need to start doing this gimmick again. You know the disco and burnout. Then start. Then that's when I was driving with Jake, and he was like educating me how to do that that character. You know. But I, I, there was a period of time I just tried it, it did, didn't work, quit doing it, and then started doing it again. You know. Did you like disco music at all? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I like, but I wouldn't like, you know, I, I liked, I liked, uh, you know, growing up. This back in the night, you know, early, early '90s, I liked, you know, I liked, you know, classic rock and roll back then. Like everybody, I like classic rock and roll. Uh, I graduated to like, you know, I like disco music. You know, that was fun. But um, I really started liking disco music when like, like a. Uh, you know when when house music became like a thing. I saw like in house music and stuff, and like dance music and you know stuff that. But that and rock and roll is what I, I kind of grew up on. You know, but I like I like the dis. I, I to me the disco the disco character, was a, a good character, because like with the music it's just it's just easy. You know, I thought I thought it was like it would be easy to do, and I like disco music enough to be like okay this this I can have fun with this. You know. Did you like Saturday Night Fever? Yeah, oh yeah. That's what the character is like, basically just, you know, John Travolta and Saturday Night Fever. This, I kind of looked similar features, you know, Italian guy. I, would, I had the big hair back then and stuff and everything and all that. And I, I looked the part, you know. No, That's what I did. I did the white suit was like my first, where I, where I got enough money to like, you know, invest in the gimmick. The white suit was the first, you know, the, the first thing, thing that people saw. It says on the internet that you had a stint in WWE early in your career. Ne never, never. I went. The only thing I ever did was drove to a show with Brian Clark, and like when he worked, he was at a box. <laughs> that, that, that was it. I, I never, I never, I never even, I never met Vince McMahon. Okay. Never met Vince McMahon. I met Shane. Never met Vince. I knew Hunter. Uh, me and Hunter were hanging out um, right before when he was in that. Uh, that uh, the no compete in between WCW and before we went to WWE, and I was I hadn't been signed yet by WCW, okay. but we were like friends. We hung out, you know. The wrestlers back in Atlanta, we, we, we hung out. Yeah. You know, we'd go to the pool together and stuff, and you know, because we were wrestling, we had a bunch of time to kill during the week. You know, we were yeah. nobody worked. You know, it's, it was, it was the indie guys. So like, you're working on the weekends all all week. You're doing nothing. You know, yeah. so we the, the wrestlers kind of like. You know, if you're in the business, you started working out with the guy, just start hanging out with him, you know? So What was Triple H like in those days? Good. I mean, he's, he's cool. Uh, kind of like identical to the way you see him now, like the way he presents himself, you right. know? Um, but he was, uh, um, it was it was funny because we went to, uh, <clears throat> we used to hang out. we go to the strip joints together and stuff and everything and all that. And, um, 
he was like a he was a big f it was funny too he became like a, I remember when he left up he was because this is the part where he left WCW right I was giving this part he was always kind of like um critical of Flair a little bit you know the, the like the way Flair would talk to him and stuff and all that but they became they became good friends and then we they went to WWE together but but I thought that was entertaining that like um uh, I knew him and you know then he he was became the click. Then I became friends with Kevin and Scott after that, you know, and I, I could see how all these guys were friends with each other when I was friends with them because we had just similar similar interest or knowledge of the business. Um, just because we kind of, all kind of thought alike, you know, about, about the business. And Joe, we all had similar kind of creative, kind of like, you know, had cool conversations about things, you know, like angles and stuff and everything. So that, that's what I remember. Have you run into him at all again since he had just, all this? Just one time at a show and um, uh, I was with in San Diego with Conan. We went backstage at a WWE show one time. I think it was a SmackDown taping, and I ran into him, shook his hand, gave him a hug, just hey, what's going on? Just had like a minute of conversation. That's about it. Okay. You know, oh no, no, and also two notes. No, that's not a, a, entirely accurate. Before that, uh, when he had um, this is later, okay, but earlier in the career, uh, when he was when he had torn his quad. Okay, before Kevin, this is when WCW went out of business, and before Kevin had, um, Kevin had gone to, 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 when WCW went out of business and Kevin was, had, wasn't working, okay, he was just, he was collecting money from WCW that they owed him, and, uh, so Hunter had, uh, torn his quad, and he was, uh, rehabbing with Dr. Andrews in, in Alabama, in Birmingham, and me and Kevin went, went to go see him because the Hunter was like, uh, you know, they had a, they actually had a, I guess this is back way back when, the early 2000s. I guess they had so many wrestlers used to go see Dr. Andrews in Birmingham. They had a ring there. At the, really? at the yeah, they had a they had a ring at Dr. Andrews. You know, the the rehab, the rehab center with all the football players. I mean, they had a wrestling ring there because I guess they had so many wrestlers. Like they, they go to rehab, they, they go in the ring. So I went and I, I worked out with 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 Hunter. Like when I just you know he bumped us around. You know he's rehabbing. You know so I just went bumped around with him and that's when Kevin got in the ring because Kevin hadn't worked in, in like maybe a year you know Kevin got in the ring showed Hunter what he could do after that uh, Hunter you know, went back up north and stuff and then, then Kevin went back up north too so so he didn't want to help you I didn't really add you know what I, I here was the thing when when WCW went out of business um, the, this is kind of like sketchy de sketchy details because I, I to me like things happen and, and a lot of time has gone by. So it's like, I, of all the things that happened in my career, it's like, Jesus, I'm not, it's like 18 years ago, you know? So it's, it's hard to remember like exact, exact details of certain things, you know? But just the one thing I remember is that like, when, when uh, WCW was going out of business, is that uh, J Johnny Ace and I did not get, not, not that we didn't get along, like we were professional with each other, but when he had come in, you know, he was telling people, you know, hey, we're coming in here, we're gonna take over, you know, I, I was on the booking, team with this so, you know we're gonna get rid of disco and stuff and he didn't realize you know he's he's telling people this hey i'm friends with these they, they're, they're they're coming and telling me what he's saying yeah. so i was just very you know I, I didn't have a high opinion of him because i okay this guy's behind my you know he's talking to cool my face behind my back he's telling people you know they're, they're, they've got a reason why to me you know, he's my good friend so i just did not i did not have a high opinion of him you know then but this is you know this is 18 years ago so it's like uh so when wcw went out of business um I had come off a period of time where I was booking for nine months, and then like the then I was off the booking team. Then like the last six, then like maybe six weeks to two months more WCW, and then we were done. You know, I was burnt out. I mean, I was just like because I, you know, it's just a lot of work. I was yeah. I was working, going on the road, come home, and we'd wake up on Wednesday morning, and I have to go to the booking meetings and stuff. You know, in, in Atlanta, just so I was just completely burnt out. So I wasn't really, you know. Um, eager to like geez I, I, I want some time off kind of right and I just forgot I forgot the conversations exactly how, the, how they went but I remember that Johnny Ace had called me up and said that uh hey you know we're talking about like uh, go, you gotta talk about you know whether we're gonna bring you in for a deal because my because the thing was with me you know back then we, we we had um your contracts were in four quarters okay so I was in the the like I had a whole quarter left when WCW went out of business, of getting paid a good chunk of change because I was making three fifty a year guaranteed, so I was going to have one quarter because like right when we went out of business, my, my quarter just started. I was going to quarter of money for doing nothing, 
So like, yeah, okay. So like when WC when when, the, when they went out of business, I was like, I'd heard stories back then that like the WWE locker room was not that, like like they weren't doing that. You know, I just heard it was just one like the the boys up there weren't happy. You know, so and I was burnt out. So I was just like, hey, I'll just stay home. And just, you know, who who would? I mean, theoretically, it's like you're making eighty grand for three months to do nothing. Yeah. You know, it's so eighty whatever it was. And uh. And so I just working for like six years straight. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's like, and um, and so I guess they had a uh, like they were talking about doing a deal or something. I, I I forget if they had called me from the point when the contract started or whether they were talking to me after the my quarter ended, like three months later. But I thought that because like back then the, the, you were hearing stories about oh they forgot guys contracts were rolling over and like they would get another quarter paid to do absolutely nothing because they forget oh this guy's kind of but I'll never forget but they could they call me like the day before my contract was get getting ready to extend they say hey we're hey we're canceling your contract I'm like yeah, all right well that makes sense you know <laughs> company's out of business everything and I just can't remember if I had the conversation then or there but they had said like hey we got to talk about like coming in for you know uh, to doing a deal. And I don't know if there was a deal where I was supposed to call them back or they were supposed to get back in touch with me, but we never corresponded after that. You know, and I just remember that one conversation with, with Ace and this, it just I just never never went to WWE. But during that time, so my contract expired, there was a little, the small period of time there where Jeff Jarrett was thinking of starting up uh, um, TNA, but we were doing, a, uh, this guy Andrew McManus, the Australian promoter, the concert promoter, was bringing us over and paying us really good money to go overseas. Right. And I was like, oh, okay, hey, this is, you know, I'm fine with this. Like, I'll just, you know, cause I never really, I never really done like, you know, gone to Japan and Australia, you know, just like for, for like as an independent guy traveling the world, I'd always done it with WCW and I was like, okay, this is cool. Let me, you know, I'm, I got, I got the money in the bank. I, I'm, this guy's paying me like, you know, wow, I'm, I can't believe how much you're paying me for like 10 days, you know? Yeah. So, I, so I was just doing that. And then, yeah, as I was doing that and then like, TNA started, so I just never really, never really got went to like didn't WWE. Never pursued it. Never, um, never called and asked, "Hey, you guys interested?" Me? I just never like did that. You know, I just so that that's how that went. Now, how did you actually get your WCW job to get back into that? To get back into it after I got fired, or to get back into no the, to uh, sorry, we got off track of it and skipped ahead. Oh, you're right, you're right, right. You were about to talk about Paige. Oh no, okay, no, no, so here's the thing. So I started doing the uh, the Disco Inferno character in this. It was mid south. They were they were they started mid south wrestling up again, and in Mississippi, and they were doing um, they were doing TV tapings on shows and uh, in um, like Indian Reservation casinos and stuff. And like buildings and like you know and i was that's the one where i had to go over and pick up jake and bring him over there uh hillbilly cousin luke was like running the show um it's so where first time first time i'd met ole anderson he had gone over there and like was helping out it's it actually a pretty good production it was dick murdoch hercules hernandez um terry taylor was one of the people helping run the show there too and i was gonna go do the disco inferno gimmick again right so i'll never forget i, I you know, i'm still i'm a green indie guy you know, they, hey, do the Disco Inferno. You know, do, they, they didn't really know me because I'd only done the gimmick in Memphis, right? Terry Taylor liked the idea of the gimmick. So I went and wrestled a match. Uh, I forgot who, it just doesn't matter. I put, put some guy over. But Terry saw me work and like we we're going to do another taping the next day. And Terry's like, hey, I'm going to work you. This is going to be fun. Right? Because he liked the gimmick and something. But when I did it, you know, they were just beating me. I was just, but I was still doing the gimmick. It's getting good heat from the crowd. It was like I was, I was getting a good reaction. Like the, the crowd was like, they did not like me. You know, this is the South. This is Jackson, Mississippi. This is, you know, I'm out there doing disco. And they're like, you know, they're like, you faggot. You know, so it's good, good heat, right? So, uh, so we did some tours over there, like back and forth. And like, they didn't call me for a month. Then Terry Taylor called me back again. It's like, hey, we're going to do another taping. And he goes, you know, we're watching the TV. He's like, you were one of the only guys that had any heat. I was like, all right. So, so then I had to go over with Terry. That's so, because they weren't using Jake anymore because Jake was <laughs> doing crack and they're like losing all this, you know. Was that around the Heroes of Wrestling time? Because I think that was... May, the... Maybe, maybe, because I, I just remember they quit using Jake because he was just a mess, you know. It was just like he'd, he'd, he'd get to the show and want the money go and then, then like he want to draw, you know, this is, this is any wrestling, you know, so like, you know, then like, he, the, the, like hours later, he'd want another draw <laughs> after he go, like, you know. I mean, so I was like, it was, it was crazy. So, uh, 
So I went and did that, and so then Terry Taylor was like, I, th I don't know if he was working with WCW at the time and doing that. He was like an Asian WCW, but like him and Paige got me a tryout with WCW at this time. So I'm like kind of fresh off the Mississippi stuff, I'm starting to do the gimmick again. I'm, start, I'm, I'm improving, so I'm working better guys. I'm working guys like Terry Taylor and stuff, you know, and, uh, and so they got me a tryout, and uh, Chris, I, I, got, I did my tryout match with Canyon. And the fans, at the, this is at the old um, center stage tapings, right? Um, in Atlanta, so a lot of the f people that used to go to the North Georgia wrestling shows that, that knew me from there would go to those, those tapings. So there's like a, you know, th those are small shows. It'd be like 400 people, 500 people there, you know, whatever it was. Like at the old TV, you know, the old studio shows. Not the studio shows, but the... Centers. Yeah, yeah, center stage, center stage. So, um, uh, so I had some fans in the crowd, right? So I go out and do my tryout match. And like, you know, back then WCW was not doing that good business, you know? I do my tryout match and these guys, my the North Georgia fans in the crowd, the guys I knew and stuff, they started the Disco Sucks chant. So I'm doing my tryout match and I'm getting one of the best reactions of anybody on the show. Crowds yelling, Disco Sucks, Disco Sucks, you know what I'm saying? And I mean, I'm wrestling Canyon, can't possibly have a bad meal. Me and Canyon used to work, train together and wrestle, so, so we knew it was gonna be, you know, it was a good match. Yeah. And I was getting good heat and they hired, they, they went back, I went back say they hired me on the spot. Who was it that actually hired you, Bishop? Uh, Terry Taylor, the, the, the Bishop of Taji. They, they, they hired me on the spot. Kevin Sullivan was there too. Um, and uh, was they Terry hired Taylor me. Was Taylor Talent Relations at that time? I think, I, mean, I think he was just an agent. Okay. Uh, Talent, some, whatever he was. But he was, uh, they, they hired me on the spot. And then I met with Eric. Uh, uh, like a, I had to go meet, meet with Eric another, like another day to talk about exactly you know, my, what my deal would be. And that, that was it. So, but they, but they hired they hired me on the spot because they, they go because I remember coming back. It was it's, for me it was Arn Anderson. So damn, can you more heat anybody out there? And I was like, it's a good gimmick, you know. <laughs> so, 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 so you know, still still to this day, it's like a, it's, it's still kind of tried and true, you know. Why do so many people hate Terry Taylor? Is it just because he I don't know, man. Me and me and him always got along. He's he's because he's maybe because he's smart and he, sometimes he's he doesn't know he's condescending. Sometimes, you know what I'm saying? Like he rubs people the wrong way. Um, but I've, I've never had a problem with Terry. I've always, I know a lot of friends of mine the business have, you know, they don't, they don't speak highly of him. They hate him and stuff or anything. But like, you know, like if I do the podcast with Coney, he calls him to Terry the Stooge Taylor. You know, when they did the, Coney did the racial discrimination suit against him and didn't say very good things about Terry. But like, but Terry to me was like, I, I was like, bro, you, if you're talent relations, that's 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 not the, you're not that's not the likable guy spot. It's like you're stuck in the spot where you got to be the, the the office stooge and tell the bosses what's going on, you know. And that's like I, w I would never want that spot, you know what I'm saying? And I think maybe there's a thing where like maybe a lot of guys that have had that spot in the past have the boys have had heat with them, you know, because like a lot of the boys would never do what they have what those guys do, you know what I'm saying? To be the be the off the you're, you're the office stooge guy, you know. But you you kind of have to have one. Who's supposed to like have you know the, the, the boys aren't telling the boss anything you know so so you have to have the guy the stooge is telling the boss what's going on if anybody's screwing up and stuff and so I always understood that Terry was in that in a bad spot, but I can understand why people don't like him. But I I can see I would never want that spot. I would never want to be the the the, 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 the stooge that you have to go you know like I like you know I work a job now and I'm not, I'm the guy that uh. I'm not, I'm not the guy that will ever tell on, on any like anybody I work with, but if you ask, if the, if the boss comes and asks me something, I'm going to tell you the truth. You know what I'm saying? So that, that's like the difference. But like, but but the guy that just goes and rats on people, that that's never been me. You know what I'm saying? But like that's that's what the that's, that's why that, I'm assuming that's why Terry probably has a lot of heat because he had that's that's the spot he had for so long. You know? And what were your first impressions of the WCW locker room? The, my first day at work, after I got hired, the first day I showed up was the day that Paul Orndorff got in a fight with Vader. I, I showed up two minutes after they got in a fight, and I was like, holy God, I, you know, I'm still from the suburbs of Marietta, Georgia. Went to private school, <laughs> so now I'm in the wrestling business, and I show up in the locker room, and Paul Orndorff just beat up Vader, and I looked at Vader, and I looked at Vader, and he, he's sitting there with an ice pack on his face. His face is like, looks like a... Like a big giant herpes sore, or something like he's all puffed up or whatever, like that. You know, it's just a, so he's a, he's just a mess. I was like, and I was thinking to myself, 
guy, you know, because I wasn't like a, you know, I, I didn't, I was an amateur wrestler or, or college football player or you know, barroom brawler. <laughs> but I was thinking, Jesus Christ, am I, am I, if I screw up here, is the guy's going to try to beat me up or something? You know, is that, I, 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 I didn't know what the locker room culture was like. It's my first day in the locker room. And I'm walking in two minutes after Paul Warner was kicking Vader in the face. You know what I'm saying? I didn't, I'd seen one locker room fight in my entire, like, like three and a half years before that, you know? Right. And I'm like, shh, man. That was with Shane Helms, right? Uh, no, no, yeah, the kid, kid Vicious. <laughs> yeah. Kid Vicious, yeah, that's yeah. Kid's great. And then hysterical. Did you hear that in the podcast that yeah. time when I told that story? I was like, I'd never like you. Know, he's a kid. Yo, you were Kid Vicious? I was like, yo, that's the only thing. The only time I'd ever seen a fight was kid, when Shane Helms got in a fight with my, with my trainer. At a show, <laughs> that's you know, the only thing I'd ever see, you know? So I guess uh, you realized that was like a rare incident after the- Oh, of course, yeah, yeah. Because all the guys, the, once I got in the locker room and there's, yeah, you just realize this is just, this kind of, it's, it's a brotherhood. You know, you know how it is. It's just like everybody's like, you know, we're all with each other. You know, these guys are with, we're with each other. I wasn't married or nothing, but like they're with us more than they are with their families. Yeah. You know, so you got the kind of the, that that bond with everybody. You know, not everybody liked each other, but everybody always res yeah, there, there was never any heat where like you know guys were gonna f fight each other like 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 after that. You know, like right. like when you see two guys like you know what I'm saying? Like wow, that must have been. I can't imagine what this was like until the Scott stuff. Yeah, yeah, days. You're right. Yeah, so it's like this is like 1995, yeah. and I'd heard stories from like 1995 before with the Steiner. You know, Scott Steiner. Bill Watson, you know, I'm hearing, hearing this, and it's kind of like, you know, Paul Lorner from Vader, but like after Paul Lorner from Vader, there, there were there wasn't really nothing, you know, except of course at that time with Paige and Steiner at, at the, you and know, but but that yeah, but but that was uh, Steiner threw a TV at Terry Taylor too. Oh, so every, man, to, to, I felt so bad for Terry, man. He'd be at that he'd be at that gorilla position, and he it's you wouldn't you, t today in this 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 PC world we live in today. There's no way Terry Taylor would have been treated like he was treated. If people treated Terry Taylor like 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 the, he, the, he was treated, they they would they would have been fired. That's how much abuse that guy took verbally from from the. I mean, it was it was brutal. He got he got cussed. I see see Macho Man Scott Steiner. I've seen Nash cut. That's, he's been cut, cussed out in front of Edio you know, in front of everybody. But, what would Macho Man's issue have been, for example? I don't. <laughs> Terry Taylor's just like, you know, it's just like bad. Like, if, if something like, hey, like Terry would tell Macho, it's supposed to have nine minutes, right? Hey, Macho, you only have six. You know, like, but Terry's the one that has to tell him. You know, it's not his fault that the guy's out there went, you know, and then Macho would be like, shot. fuck you, tell you, motherfucker, you're trying to ruin my career. You know, it's just screaming at him, like, Jesus Christ, you know. So I feel like going, like, Macho, I, I felt like saying, hey, take it easy on the guy, it's not his fault. You know, like, I felt sorry for Terry sometimes. You know, he would just get abused and he would just sit there and just, you know, he just had to take it. They, they did. The, the office did not protect his spot at all. They let those guys just just completely abuse him. But but, but back then, the culture, the locker room culture was different. You know, you guys would just do the guys would yell at Terry Taylor. That was that was the thing. Like, there's no way these days the boy. Yeah, guys, you can't cuss you know, uh, office people out in front of like, you know in front of office and stuff and anything. Like that. You just don't do that. You know. Did you have any other experiences with Macho Man backstage? No, no, not I mean, me and Macho were cool. We had a he was a um, he he was he was cool with me. We we had a, I'll, I'll tell you one thing though. To to this I, I didn't really repeat this story, but uh, there there was a spot where I, I wrestled him and he was doing the, his his loose cannon thing. They were putting him over strong because they were building him up for the for the belt, right? And there was a spot where he was like the loose cannon, so he. he he beat me, but he was gonna drop like three or four elbows on me, you know, from the top rope, just to like wipe me out, you know. And he dropped one of them, and it landed on my shoulder. But I mean, I never got it fixed, and to to this day, my shoulder hurts. I just never got it's just my shoulder just hadn't been right since since then, you know. But it wasn't like you know, it's just this is sore, you know. But but like, th this is from a macho man elbow. This is hell, like third, well, nine, 98. Was it ninety eight now? To twenty years ago, maybe. Yeah. I, I never had to operate on or nothing, so I was like, you know. But but that's that. But uh, I'll never forget one time. You know, they just had the Andre special, the the HBO documentary. They were um, <clears throat> they were uh, you know, the, when they were talking about Andre didn't like Macho, you know, and they were telling the story about how you know Macho did you know they, they didn't like Macho because he had an oil oil. Or like he's ran his mouth. It's like that's not you know. He didn't like Macho because Andre did not like the way Macho treated Elizabeth. That that's the story, okay. And that comes from you know, you know Gene and Bobby and stuff. They, 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 we 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 talk about it, right? 
<clears throat> and I remember we were talking about they were talking about Andre one day, and Macho was like, you know, like Macho was there, and they were, they were, everybody's telling Andre stories. So there'd be people tell Andre stories, you know. Yeah. And uh, I remember Macho was telling one story one time. He was like, he's like, yeah, brother. He's like, I'm because I'm in the match with him. We weren't talking about like, like I think Randy knew why Andre didn't like him, you know. But like they didn't talk about that in the documentary. But like, he, but he was talking about one match he had with Andre, where he was gonna do, you know. You do the spot where like you hit the ropes and hit Andre for the tackle and bounce off and stuff and everything. And Macho was just like, yeah, man, it's like, um, I go to hit him with the, the one tackle, you know. And then I go and hit him, you know, hit the ropes again. I go to hit the other tackle. He just sticks his fist out. He fucking busted my nose. And I'm like, okay, that's cool, you know. It's like Andre, like that. That's how Andre would abuse him, yeah. you know. Like he just didn't, you know, punch him in the face, you know, but he did hard, you know, like for broke his nose, you know. Yeah. And like I, my just telling me that story, you know, that yeah, Andre didn't like me. That's you know, that's, that's you know, so I didn't tell that story in the documentary, but that Macho told told me that I story. Heard he did that to a lawyer too. I've heard actually. Maybe, maybe yeah, maybe, yeah, but, but they don't like you know they don't talk yeah, yeah that's yeah. they're just they, he, he Andre didn't like the for other you know because he thought that they were oil. Yeah. <laughs> so right, you know, when I punch you in the face, you got oil on. He's like, geez, you know, it's like Jesus. Oh man. Yeah, because in those days everyone has. Like tons of oil on them. In yeah. Movies. Oh yeah. And you had a lot of matches with Eddie Guerrero in WCW. What were they? Like a matches? handful, just yeah. great. But but I, I I to this day I tell I tell everybody he's 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 the best. The, I, I can just speak on guys I've been in the ring with. By far the best performer I've been I've been in the ring with. Just that. Just great. I mean he's just, I don't think he, he his only flaw might have been he was he's, he he was undersized. He had no, no, zero flaws in his work, just nothing. I mean, his selling, his fire, his everything. He just looked tough, you know, worked tough, you know, stuff and anything. I, I just tell people to say, I said, the the best in-ring performer, hands down, head and shoulders, I've been in the ring with all, all those guys, you know, was Eddie Guerrero. The best in-ring experience I ever had was against Ric Flair because it was the first time I'd ever been in the ring with somebody and literally felt like, I was like motionless and being dragged through the match. Like like he's literally like I'm not consciously doing anything. He is like like hypnotically pulling me through the way the way he worked and just positioned you and stuff and everything he did. I, I've never I'd never experienced anything like that before wrestling Ric Flair. Because he was he was that good at professional wrestling that he that, that's why he could wrestle anybody. Yeah. And did for you know, you're the champ, you have to go wrestle every here you go all over, and that's how he learned. He just, you know, everybody says like Rick, Rick ha always had the same match, but it's like tr try going out there making the guy, the, all these different workers he's worked against, yeah. have the same match with all these different guys with different styles. It's hard to do. You know, <laughs> it's hard to do. Have the, have the same match with Rufus R. Jones that you're having with Nikita Koloff. You know, like say it's just yeah. so that's just like the Rick was just like an incredible experience in the ring. You know, I only wrestled him like maybe three times, but it was like, wow! I just, how does this guy do this? I go, this is his brilliance. You know, it's like I, 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 I couldn't, couldn't even comprehend. Like, how, how, how do I learn how to do that? You know, it's like where I can just, you know, like you're, you're, make it look like you're combating the guy, but you're really, he's really positioning you to do this. It was weird. I was like, I never. It was crazy. You know. I always think about that in my company because sometimes. Wrestlers will say, "I don't want to work with this inexperienced person who's mm -hmm. below me." Right. But if you're that good. If you're that good, yeah, exactly, yeah. perfect. Because I was like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm wasn't green, but I wasn't as seasoned as him. And I'm like, wow, no wonder the, this this guy's. Was that the Thunder match, or did you have multiple? No, matches? the first match I had was on a house show in Lakeland, Florida, and we went out there, and this was like, you know, and it was the first time I'd ever done this with him. I, I told him, I said, you know, before we went through the curtain, this is the first time I wrestled Rick Flair. I was like, I, I just got to tell you, man, it's like, a, you know. This is like a you know, dream come true experience for a guy like me. I grew up watching you, you know, and, and you're one of the reasons like people want to become wrestlers. It's, it's incredible to be able to do this. He was like, man, thank you very much. I really appreciate that, you know. Thing. And so we went out there, and I was like, wow, this is just. And he's the guys like you. I would always have good magic guys because I sold for everybody. They they like working with me because I, you know, I make their stuff look good. So he would chop me, and I would sell like I got shot, you know. So it's like it was, it was good. You know, the, 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 I, if nobody's ever, if you, uh, the guys, probably the guys have wrestled Flair. I don't know if they'd repeat, they, they'd tell this similar story, but if you haven't wrestled Ray Flair and you wrestle Ray Flair, you just know the difference, you know. 
Now, you also had some matches with Kevin Sullivan. What did you think of him as a wrestler? I don't, I don't think I had. Uh, did I work Kevin? According, according to the issue that you did, so maybe it's wrong. Few no, no, no. You know what I was doing? Here's the thing. I don't, I don't think I ever worked. Because <sighs> back uh, in WCW, did I work with him? Because here's the thing. I was supposed to have a match with him on a... On a um, on a, it was one of those live shows like Clash of the Champions or something like that. I was supposed to have a match with them. Uh, Kevin was just going to go out and squash me because he was doing the Dungeon Doom back then. Jimmy Hart said we can't. Went to Kevin and said, "Hey, we can't beat Disco. He's getting hot." You know, like saying like uh, my, there was no reason for, for, for like like Jimmy Hart liked my character. He wrote the music for it. You know, he loved, when he found the Disco character, he just like, "Oh my God, this I love this." You know, so he was like Jimmy just like Jimmy helped me a lot. You know, he did the music and everything. But uh, I was supposed to wrestle him on that on that show. But they took me out, and we do, I, I did a spot where um, uh, Colonel Parker was was marrying Sensational Sherry, okay. And like it's funny because I remember seeing something like like in things like uh, like Kevin Sullivan went out for the match, and I didn't show up or something like that because I think it says Kevin Sullivan beat Disco Inferno, like would be part of the results. And I'll be like, I never wrestled him, but that but the result was Kevin Sullivan beat Disco Inferno by. Count out or DQ because I didn't show up for the match because I was at the the, the wedding spot because this was, the show was in Vegas at Caesar's yeah. Palace and I think that's because I don't remember I don't remember I don't recall ever working with Kevin okay. in the ring you know maybe we did on once probably just a brawl just be you know but I mean that's like I said I, I, if 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 I did and he remembers it you know but I don't remember I don't recall wrestling and how did you find him as a booker uh, to, you know he he was a uh, He's a brilliant guy, very intelligent, very creative. But um, back then, you know, the, this the thing in WCW was the NWO and Heat, you know, and stuff like. That. I and me and a lot of the other mid card guys, we just never really got the feeling that they really cared a lot about like the underneath stuff. You know what I'm saying? Like like when um, I just always thought that I could be like another honky tonk man, you know, give, give me give, give me the, a belt and like give me a run with it. With like some angles against guys instead, of just give me the belt for like a couple months, just go out there and do a twelve minute match on TV, and that's it. You know what I'm saying? I thought I thought there was a lot more that could have been done, and that, that they never, they never, you know, that, that that he never did. You know, so I mean, but he was a, very very intelligent. You know, I mean, I'm not gonna. I just I, I just thought I just thought it was underutilized. It's a, it's, but that's not a knock on him or anything. But but you know, a lot of mid card guys were underutilized back then. But that's just the way it was. It was the top guys and the mid card guys. You know, the mid car guys didn't have a lot of angles. The top guys did. The top guys got all the interview time. The mid car guys well, didn't really get much, you know. But what, what are you going to do? That's, that, that was the same playing field for me as anybody else, so, you know. But I, what are you going to argue with? We're doing these ridiculous ratings, you know, like the ratings are going through the roof. We're doing good business, you know, everything's sold out, and you're just, you're along for the ride and working, you know, sold out house shows and sold out TVs every night for, for, for a couple of years. So it's like, what, what, can, what, what can I say, you know? Yeah. yeah. How was your popularity then outside, like when you were in the mall or going around because wrestling was so popular? Um, it was very, when, when the thing was because you, the, when you're in the, you, the, the boys we all travel together, right? So all I can really speak of is like, you know, when we were in the town that night that we're wrestling in and like and we would go to the mall or we go to eat, I mean, the 100% of the time somebody recognized us. Like at least somebody or people coming, you know, just every, everywhere we went, you get to just, when it's like, we always traveled in groups, you know, three or four of us, everywhere you went, some, somebody knew who you were. I mean, it was, it was the height of popularity, you know, but when I was back in Atlanta, you know, I'd, I'd lived, I grew up there my whole life. So, you know, I'd go out and people, you know, people knew, so yeah, of course I'm recognizable, but I'm recognizable because I've, I've lived there too for a long time and I knew a lot of people, you know, so... But, uh, but yeah, just, um, it was just really crazy how popular we were back then. Was there groupies and everything in those days? Do you know what the thing was? We, we didn't, there, there was, okay? But it's funny, because like, the, the whole like ring rat, groupie scene, it, it didn't want you, it's not what people, you think, because the older guys, okay, they would like hang out at the hotel bar, and the groupies and the ring rats were all like older, you know, they, they were like four. You know, the, the chicks that were the groupies when they were twenty five years old were, were groupies when they were thirty eight. 
you know, <laughs> they're kind of like the same ones, you know, so, and they would always hang out with it, with them. We would always go, like like our crew, we'd go to the hotel bar just to grab one beer, round everybody up, find out where the strip joint was, go to the strip joint, and when you're at the strip joint, okay, well, where, where are the clubs? Okay, and then we, from the strip joint, we'd go to the clubs, okay, where's the after hours? All right, so that's, that's, that's what we do. Our, our crew was going out, so it wasn't like the, you know, the, the, the groupies aren't out, you know, we're, we're, we're not... You know, we're not going where the groupies are. We're going out on the town. You know what I'm saying? The groupies are coming to the hotel. Right. And we were we were never the, really the hotel. Our, our crew was not the hotel crew. You know, the, the, all the older guys were like the hotel crew. So you weren't going back to your hotel and popping in a video game in those days? No, God. <laughs> no, I'll tell you what, some of the guys, there was a, there was a period of time, even like the, like, like the guys would bring video games and something, and there was like a dead town, like we went out, or like I wasn't playing, I wasn't a video gamer, but like but a lot of my crew was. You we'd go out and there wasn't nothing going on. We'd go back to the hotel, and go play video games. But it wasn't like you were leaving the show to go to your room and go play video games. You were leaving the show. Hey, what are we doing tonight? If there's nothing to do, okay, let's just go to the room and play video games. That that's that's the difference, you know. Now you had some matches with Alex Wright, and you also were uh, tag team partner with him twice, I guess, for two different runs. Any yeah. thoughts on him? Yeah, great. I, I, lo I love being with Alex. We, we drove a lot. He was funny too, man, because he was like he's G German, you know. And, and uh, he, his wife, he would always, uh, you know, back then we get the old school cell phones. You know, we start. It started with you know when we we started WCW. We're still in the beeper age. Right. You know, you had a beeper and pay phone. You know, that's how, that's how you communicate with people and stuff. And then all of a sudden the cell phones came out and everybody had like the old school cell phones. And I'll never forget, we were driving with Alex. When the cell phones came out, Alex was like, okay, this is great. Now, I could talk to my wife like 10 times a day. And it would just be the same conversation every time. Like, Liebe, 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 He's like, I love you, I love you, honey, move a smooch. <laughs> Like hours in the car with this guy. Every five minutes, he's picking up the phone. Like, you know, leave it, leave it, leave it. <laughs> so, but and it was funny too because he was always a uh, real healthy, conscious when when we travel with the food, and he would always need like you know we go like you want egg whites and tell them they, they want cooking you know they cook with cooking spray. This is back before like egg whites and cook you know yeah. this is you know but back then. Things were like, uh, we were the day and the age of like carbohydrates are still like a big deal. You know, you know, steamed hash browns and Waffle House and egg whites and chicken breasts. You know, you know that, that's what guys would eat, you know. And Alex was always a pain in the ass because he would have, his order would have to be perfect. <laughs> so, I mean, that was just like, you know, to have like a hamburger or something. You know, but uh, I was still in shape though, but I, I would eat healthy when I was home. But, uh, but he was um, a great worker. He was tough too. I'll tell you what, like, like there'd, be, there'd be times when I'm... Um, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't shoot. I was a shooter. You know, his dad was a shooter. He knew how to shoot. I didn't. I didn't grow up with any amateur, you know, wrestling experience. You know, so if, if a guy ever wanted to shoot on me out there, oh, you know, that'd be I'm shit creek without a paddle. But uh, it was funny because like I, guys would uh, like we we work and guy you know tough guys we'd work tough guys and you know they they you know they chop me you know they, they kind of try to rough me up a little bit. I just sell when Alex would get in there, he'd kind of get hot. Right. But these guys are trying to make us look bad, and Alex would, you know, <laughs> it's like, damn, it's like, it's kind of like trying to you know, give it to some of these guys, you know, so it's like a lot of the tough guys, Alex didn't, Alex didn't take shit from anybody in that ring, you know, and he would get his shit in, he was like, you know, you're not gonna like, you're not gonna, you're not gonna job me out, but that, that's the psychology he learned from his dad, you know, his dad was a shooter, dad was a champion in Europe and stuff, you know, so you're, you're not gonna make Alex look bad, you know what I'm saying, me, if they would just beat me up, I would just sell, so. And you had a match against Bulldog and Jim Nighthart, I mm -hmm. guess, in WCW. What was that match like? Was just, yeah. <laughs> but you know, back the, the, those guys were, were kind of kind of strange. They would be off on their own. They, they, they disappear. Couldn't find them. You know, stuff. So, but uh, but that's the match where he said that he uh, hurt his back on the on the the, the trap door, right? Yeah. That, so okay, like so that's again. He's like suit. Yeah, but like, you know what? I heard. I don't know the the, the details. Maybe you can help me out on this. I'd heard that the details were that he didn't know that there was a trap door, and like so he took a bump and like and I'm like that's completely that's heard you heard that too yeah. that, that's why I heard so I'm like that's complete fabrication <laughs> that that trap door everybody and their mother knew the trap door was there that day because they told hey there's a trap door in the ring because a lot of us would go out in the ring before the match you know and stuff everybody knew it was a trap door 
You know, and something like it. Maybe it was a deal because you couldn't find. Maybe, maybe when we went over the match with those guys, they, they we didn't go in the ring. But I find it very hard to believe that they did not know that there was a trap door because the whole crew knew about the trap door. So that's not like it wasn't like it's oh, there's a trap door in here. Like we found out when we walked out there for the match. Right. So that I always thought that like I was like he's suing for that. <laughs> so I was like that's a, that's a strange because I, I, we all knew it was a trap door, you know. So but that's. It was. It wasn't a very good match. They, they, those guys were. They just weren't. You know, they were all WWE guys on top and stuff and everything, and they working with us. So they, they made, like we were below them or something. You know, it just wasn't a good match. Did what, what, what a good experience. Oh, okay. You know, yeah. Did you have any contact with the Warriors? Speaking of the Warrior. <sighs> Briefly, not not really. Dude, when he came to WCW, he was kind. It was kind of funny because the boys that knew him, you know, because he'd been gone for a while and he came back. And his fight, who was I talking to? Maybe, well, he was dug in or somebody. It was like, just funny because, like, Warriors reconnect with all his WWE friends and stuff in the you know. And they're funny because, like, they're coming to me and talking about how Warriors referring to himself in third person when he's talking to the boys. You know, <laughs> so I was like, well, yeah, Warriors, like, he's just talking like, a th you know, like he's doing an interview, but he's in the locker room. You know, <laughs> it's like, it sounds like, it's just weird. The guy was weird. The guy, the guy was weird, but I'll tell you this, this was stories I heard about him, you know, that people would tell me were, were, were interesting. I always, I always tell this story, too, is that, um, God, I used to tell him so much better years ago when I knew the exact details, but he was very strict on his diet, like what he would eat. Like, supposedly he would only, like, don't quote me exactly on this, but like, hypothetically speaking, right, it was grilled chicken breast, egg whites, bagels, Bananas, um, bagels, bananas, and uh, maybe like just one other thing. Like that's all he ate, right? And uh, he took like remember the mini thins? Yes. He would he would take he would use like like take fifteen of those at a time. Okay, like you're supposed to take like two mini thins back then. You know? He would take like fifteen at a time and go to like a bottle like every other day supposedly. I was like, Jesus, you know, this, is that safe? You know, but that, it's like, no, you know, I'm like, you know, that, that can't possibly be safe. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm educated enough to know, like, okay, it says take two, you know, this for your heart or whatever, you know, so it's, it's not good for you, right? So, uh, so he would take like 15 of those days, but, but what the thing was, the people would tell me, I don't know if you've heard this before, but uh, they said that when um, he would, he would want to, like, uh, cheat on his diet, say, like, for instance, it was a cheat day or whatever you want to cheat. He would, he would run, or maybe he'd cheat every day doing this, but he would take like like a cookie, okay? He wouldn't eat cookies, so he'd have like a specific thing to eat. He would take the cookie, and he'd like crumble it up in his hands, and he'd smell it to get the, the, the smell sensation without f having the calories. And he would do that with like desserts and stuff and everything, that, that's what he would do, is like he would, he would smell the food so he didn't ingest the bad calories. All he would eat was the chicken breast, the egg whites, the bagels, the bananas, you know, whatever, whatever it was. And I, I thought like, it's like, wow, that's kind of like, who would think of that, you know? He was just like, kind of like, you know what I'm saying? That, that's how kind of, like, I've never heard of anybody on the planet, like ever, like, even speaking this, everything. But the warrior, that's that's what he would do. He was just, he was just like different, man. <laughs> it's, it's very strange, you know? And I could picture him doing that too. Right. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> so I guess you ran into some controversy with uh, this Jacqueline angle, if, mm -hmm. if you want to explain that whole situation. Well, this is before, okay, so, so when they had Jackie on TV and she was beating people up, like, and she had just come, she's fresh off, like, jumping Chris Benoit from behind him, you know, clobbering, right? So they wanted her to, to go and beat a guy, right? And they weren't doing anything with me and stuff or anything. So they called, it was kind of weird. Instead of just telling me this is a show, and like, they had me go down the offices. Like the WCW office, hey, come in for a meeting. Got to meet with me and Kevin, you know, and Eric. And uh, they go and meet, and they're telling me, they, hey, they want, they want us to have a match with Jacqueline, and they wanted, want me to put, him, put her over. And I was like, you know, this, we, the, the, the intergender stuff hadn't, hadn't been done yet. This is before China. And stuff and all that. So it's like it's, it's hadn't been done, right? And um, you know, when when we're in the meeting, say you know, this is Kevin Sullivan and, and Eric, and I'm like, all right, you know, we're, we're discussing it. And I'm like, you know, well, I'm like, how do you guys see this? And like, Kevin's like, I see you having a hell of a match with her. And I'm thinking like, 
it's like I know you're trying to put it over on TV like dude but like I I know wrestling is a work I go but I'm 230 pounds and she's like 120 I go what <laughs> it's like, I don't I mean other than me going in there like is it, you know breaking her neck I go I don't envision you what how you see a competitive match here you know you know what I'm saying like I, I she goes then they go well she she beat up Chris Benoit you know the, the, like Eric's trying to tell me she she beat up Chris Benoit and I said, go, okay, well, sh then shouldn't the match be against Chris Benoit? I was like, you know, so, like, so there you go. So, okay, so what do you guys see me doing after this? And Eric's like, um, uh, well, Kevin's like, he's like, well, I see it like disappearing for like six months, you know, stuff and thing. And Eric's like, no, 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 I, I see like, um, like maybe like, you know, like uh, somebody tries to egg you about it and you get mad about, you know, stuff and thing. And they're telling me this, and I'm like, okay, these guys haven't even thought about what they're doing with me after this, because neither of them are on the same page. And I've got four months left on my deal. So I'm thinking, like, okay, they haven't talked about re-signing me. i got four months left and talking about me, me jobbing to a girl. And so I'm like, and then so I'm just immediately thinking, okay, if I, obviously if I leave here, I'll go to New York. And I'm just thinking to myself, okay, what are the New York fans going to do if I come there? Oh, they're going to really give it to me up there for getting, you know, that's my... Yo, like my last bit of WCW is gonna be my girl. Now I'm going to New York, or even it's gonna like in their minds. I don't know how how they think if it's gonna cost me a job. So I leave the I leave the room, and I immediately call. You know, Paige and me were good friends. You know, me and Terry were good friends, and Terry was on the on the booking committee back then. Right. Was one, okay, bro. No, but every single person I talked to, Paige, Terry Taylor, every said don't do it. They said don't don't do it. Like I didn't talk to one person that said hey yeah yeah that's a good go go do that. You know what I'm saying? So they all tell me don't do it. And I said, so I went to Eric one day and I said, hey, can't do it. And he goes, okay, you're fired. I'm like, all right. So they, so they, got, they got rid of me, right? And then um, they had, and it was funny because they had said that it's fine. You can, can I go wrestle wherever I want to after this? You know, if you guys, they did that. And Eric said, yeah, our lawyer hit me with the, the no compete, the four month, their, their lawyer okay. hit, hit me with the no compete, even though Eric had said I could go do whatever I want, right? You know, so I was, I'm I'm stuck. So I'm stuck for four months doing nothing, and uh, <clears throat> um, and that's when I was having conversations. Jim Cornette, Cornette had called me up a couple times. Hey, what's your status? And they told me the exact same thing. I got my four month no compete. Now I got three months left. I got two months left. Then I called. Then Bruce Pritchard called me, and he's like, "What's your status?" I go, "Well, it's the same as it's been as I previously talked talk to Cornette." He goes, he goes, he goes. So what? So what was the story? He goes, "Well, I just I, I told Jim." He goes, well, "I'd rather hear from the horses, you know, ahead than the, the horses." I'd rather hear from the horses after the horses. I'll never forget that. Bruce Pritchard's like, yeah. I'll never hear it's talking about Cornette, like a guy where I'd rather hear from the horses about than the horses' heads. So, that's, that's the only real detail. I remember that conversation. But I just told him, I said, that I basically told the story kind of like how I, to I told you, you know? He said, okay, so, uh, so the, they, they didn't sign me. And it's like, supposedly, they, um, somebody, years later, I found out maybe through Russo that, that uh, he had said that. Um, he didn't give. I didn't give him the answers that he wanted to hear, or something like that. But I, I but Russo thought that I was coming in because they were putting a silhouette of me in their magazine, like coming soon, like the Honky Tonk Man's yeah. protege, or some somewhere thing, right? So out of all this, like they didn't sign me, and uh, I saw Sting in the gym, and Sting was like, "Why? Why did they get rid of you?" Know, he didn't know the story of why they got they had gotten rid of me, and I repeated the story again to Sting, and Sting said, "Let me see what I can do." Sting went and talked to Eric, they brought me back. And I'll never forget Eric, he brought me back the first day, and it was like, uh, oh, we gotta figure out a way for you to get, put over Jacqueline. I was like, all right. So the funny thing was this, they, they cared so less about the mid card back then. Is that, okay, I'm like, okay. So like, we're sliding on, on the card, when, when am I gonna put her over? You know, I'm not just gonna immediately get, because I'm coming back, we gotta get into the angle with whatever. <laughs> so you know what Terry did? Terry put the TV title on me. Thinking that okay, there's no way that Eric could be dumb enough to let the, let the TV champion could be my girl, right? And the, like, bro, to get the bookers like working yeah. Eric to try. That's how like this was WCW back then. Like, just just no real like set plan. People on the same page or something. So they put the they, they put the title on me, hopefully thinking that I wouldn't have to put over Jacqueline now, right? And so so they kept doing it. But eventually, so here was the thing. So they finally started having the beginning the angle with Jacqueline. And Eric com comes to me and says, "Yo, okay, so here's the deal. It's like, yo, yo, everything we've known, you know, when you grow up, you're, we're not supposed to hit a girl, but you have this girls coming after you, you know. So, so, and you have you've been backed into a corner. And what, what do you do?" And I was like, like, "Why didn't you guys just tell me this beforehand? You know, it's like I can work a match around where, okay, I'm not going to abuse a girl, 
But if she's out there kicking my ass, what can I do? Other, you know, I'm not going to punch her in the face. How do I negotiate a match around a girl when, when you, you've been told all your life you can't, you can't beat up a girl? You know what I'm saying? But she's trying to kill you. You know what I'm saying? So that so say, okay, I, I, can, I can work with that story. You know, not just like, okay, go and have a hell of a match with her. I'm like, what does that mean? I was like, okay, I'm, you because know, my hell of a match is like, I'm beating up a girl, you know what I'm saying? I'm beating my opponent. So, so it, it actually, and we pulled it off. It actually got, I was, I was surprised. I'll tell you what, she clotheslined me harder than I've ever been clotheslined by any guy in the business ever, ever. She hit me with a clothesline. I was like, holy shit. I mean, you know, I, I haven't gotten concussions, but not that like what we know about concussions today, but, but she, and they come to think of it, she rang my bell. You know, so there she is. Which when she closed on me, I was like, "Holy shit!" It's like it woke 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 me up. You know, I was like, "Jesus." So, but but I ended, ended up doing the job for her. So, and then all of a sudden after that, then China started coming. Then then it was like okay to like just integrate, you know, guys working with girls and stuff. So, the saddest part about all of that is you would have been the perfect protege for Honky Tonk Man. Yeah, I know, right? Because <laughs> it didn't go well with Billy Gunn, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I would have been working with the Honk Man, who, who basically, that's who I studied when I was developing, how am I going to do the, the, the disco character, you know? The Honky Tonk Man goes out there and does this, and does a couple moves, like, oh, I'll just do like the same theory, and I'll just go out there and do my dance moves, you know, instead, like like when the Honky Tonk does it, I used to study the Honky Tonk, like when he'd do it in the match. You know, so it would have been, we would have been, we would have been a pretty good, that would have been an entertaining, like, like little deal there, right there. Plus you had uh, Cornette and Russo on your side. Yeah, well, that had Russo on my side. Cornette, I don't know. Uh, oh, Cornette was just, yeah. Cornette. Russo was the writer. Cornette was office. Okay. You know, yeah, so him and Bruce were talent relations, assistant talent relations back then or whatever it was, you know. I never spoke with Russo before he came to WCW. So I yeah. guess it would have been ultimately Bruce's fault that uh, that never happened. Maybe, I, but I don't feel like I said I don't remember the exact details of that conversation. But I, I just I was surprised. I'm like, well, why would these guys not want this character? Yeah, you know that that seems weird to me. You know what I'm saying? Or do something similar to that? I just don't. I thought I was built. For, I thought I was a WWE character in the WCW. And but, I remember that magazine too. It's surprising that they did. That. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, That's what right. <laughs> it's like yeah, I was like, well, what what happened? You know? Yeah. But then they got to the point where my no compete was up. And I was thinking of pursuing that even more, like trying to, like still trying to get in the WWE, but that's when St I met Sting, and Sting's that will get your job back. And I needed work, you know, back then. And you had a little feud with Saturn. Uh, mm -hmm. What was he like? Great. And, yeah. Loved working with him. It's funny too, because he it was a, it was a good dynamic, because he was like a tattooed thug, you know, type type character, and I was like this pretty boy, you know, stuff and everything. But we, um, it was funny too, because I'll never forget uh, there. Were, I very rarely, I, I can probably count on three fingers the amount of times that when I was working on TV that I just flat out forgot a spot. You know, you just draw like, and I did it with a match against Perry, right? Where I just did a thing where it was like tackle drop and I like drop down, I have no clue what I'm doing next and I'm just kind of like running aimlessly <laughs> back and forth and, and Perry stopped me and threw him up against the ropes and, and did these kicks that looked like he, that because I screwed up the spot, yeah. as a shoot, he was kicking me in the face. And when we got back from the match, Terry Taylor like st started yelling at Perry for shooting on me out there. I was like, Terry, the, the, those kicks were work. You know, he's not, I'm, I'm fine. You know, so we came the, and that was the thing, because Terry looked, his, Perry's stuff looked believable. Yeah. You know, so we would always, we would work good together, because he looked like he was roughing me up out there, you know, and I like selling. So we, I, I always liked working with him because we're very, it was very easy to go over matches with him. We always had good matches. We worked a lot of house shows. Uh, it was always the, um, so some, some of my better stuff was with him. What do you think about, I guess, the mental issues he's suffering from these days? I can't, bro, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, see, here's the thing is, I got my bell rung a couple times, didn't have any symptoms from it, always worked safe. Um, I, uh, uh, maybe two, three years ago, I got my first where I know I got a concussion, like uh, in a, in a match where I was I was working against this guy, he kicked me in the head. When I got kicked in the head, I immediately had a black. This is after like we know about CTE and stuff and everything, you know. Kicked in the head, had a black flash, um, and had a lump on my head from getting kicked in the head. But after the match, I just had this lump on my head. I didn't have like a headache or nothing, you know. I just had so I just put ice on it and stuff and everything, just like a, a little you know, bump, and um. 
and I'm not feeling any symptoms, no, no nausea, no nothing. You know, the, the, everything's fine, no headache. I, I go home, I get to my house, and I can't remember the security code to get back in my house. And that's like this, this symptom, I guess, of like, so I know I had a concussion because it, I, 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 I know the guy. I know the code to get my house. I lived here for two years, you know. Yeah. So, uh, so, but I never had any experience like that when I was in W. When I when I'd been wrestling in WCW, I had a couple times maybe like I hit on my got my bell rung, but never had any like forgetfulness, not, not nothing. So I can't speak on what guys go through that have gotten concussions that don't tell anybody that that, that didn't you know. And like and like the mental issues that come from because I know for a fact I just never really got hardly any concussions. Right. Never felt nauseous. Never had headaches. Never 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 experienced any of that. You know. But I know guys that, that did. I knew guys that like back, back then. When you, in retrospect, you knew guys were probably concussed, and like they shouldn't be working. But like back then, it was like okay, if you don't work, you're not tough. You know, getting your head bell rung is like hey, everybody gets their bell rung. But I didn't really have my bell rung a lot. You know, I mean, a couple, a couple times. So uh, one with Jackie. And I think I, they come to think of it, I think I maybe got maybe got my bell rung on a Goldberg spear one time, because I was watching one of the matches I had against him, and uh, he flattened me like pretty hard. I think, and I took a really hard bump, and I think I hit my head because he picks me up for the for the jackhammer, and I'm just like, you know how like when you got for a suplex and you post up on the guy, I'm kind of like just dangling there. Like he can't, he's like trying to hold me. I'm not posting him or nothing or anything. He's having trouble with me. You know, and finally, he finally got me. I was thinking like, maybe I got my bill run there too. You know, yeah. so big, but I'm just, you know, like concussions, concussions where you're just day, days and I haven't never, never had them. So I feel bad for Perry because I'm sure he probably, you know, cause he worked a lot rougher and plus, yeah. plus, you know, I, you, I can count on five fingers in my entire career that anybody ever hit me in the head with a chair. And I always put my hands up. I was like, I was not one of those guys. I'm, I'm, it's, you, I'm, not, I'm not letting you. Like the, the ECW back then, yeah. guys were clobbering each other's hairs. And like, if you didn't put your, if you put your hands up, you weren't tough. Yeah. So I can't even imagine, like maybe the issues that these guys are having from repeatedly concussing themselves, even probably when they're suffering from previous concussions, or just all, all these guys hit each other with, with, over the head with chairs, and what that can cause later in life. Yeah. I, I don't know. So so whatever Perry's going through, you know, I, I know it's probably. I hear guys get depressed and stuff, but I can't speak on that because I've never suffered those. I, I have no clue what, what they're experiencing. You know what I'm saying? And you mentioned that uh, thing with Goldberg. How did he treat you as like an uh, undercard talent? When he was oh, no. We, I knew Bill from... We went to Georgia together. Okay. I knew him before. You know, when I saw him at WCW, he was like, you're coming here? It's like, wow, that's great. Because <laughs> like, it, it was funny, too, because we... Uh, <clears throat> my... um. My uh, apartment that I lived in was literally like right next door to a bar that Bill worked at. And the entry of the bar, they had these stairs going up and Bill would be the guy that would check IDs. You know, like he was the bouncer at the bar and he always had a, a sleeveless Dallas Cowboys t-shirt on. Had the Dallas Cowboys star white and he just, just recognized. He had a mullet too, he's like he's a big, big guy. Yeah. And the, the when the bar would be open and then Bill was working there, you could literally like like look out my window and look and see Goldberg checking IDs at, at the at the bar next door, right? So uh, when I went to Georgia, a bunch of my my high school friends were there too, and they were our, our high school baseball team was the I didn't play baseball, but we were three year state champions and like broke a record for the most home runs. But none of these guys wanted a lot of these guys didn't go out and play college ball. So maybe like one or two of them. So, but all these guys, we played intramurals at Georgia, and we had kind of got the team together, right? So our team and Bill's team, he was he was had the, like all the football players, right? So the, there are two intramurals uh, softball teams, and then the school paper they would rank the teams. Our teams were ranked number one and number two, right? And there was an inevitable showdown that we were going to be going. So we would always come like talk trash, like hey, let's, okay, when we play, let's play for a keg, you know? So they, so, so so like you know, and uh, it's funny too because. Um, both of our teams lost in the semifinals, and Bill's team lost because Bill made an error because he thought this, there were three outs, and he, he caught the ball and like threw it down the ground, and, and, one, and they lost the game because one of the teams came, came around the score because Bill's error. The, it was a fraternity, right? So, I got the details are sketchy on this, but um, from what I remember, okay, is that they think the uh, the 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 what you call it, 
like the school had put on a uh, like the fraternity had put on a, like a big poster outside. It's a Goldberg's equation: one plus one equals two, or well, one plus two, uh, one plus one equals three. Like making fun of. Yeah. You know, and I heard that like the football players want to go over there and fight and stuff. <laughs> like, so, but that was, that's like how, how me and Bill like knew each other before. We like we would trash talk each other like intramurals and stuff and all that. And uh, then when he came into WC, he played football. You know, he was great. I mean, he was he was an unbelievable. Like if you ever watched Bill Goldberg play college football, he was one of the best players in the country. And I was like, uh, and I'll never forget one play that he made um, when I was, I was at a game. He like he got he got he got his bell rung. And he was like completely dazed, like you see him shaking off, you know, like I'll never forget, I, I, I never even spoke to him about this. But he like sh was shaking off, like you tell he was like out of it, you know? And like, did, he wasn't coming out of the game, this is back in, you know, this is back in the late 80s, early 90s, you know? Like, this, nobody knew about concussions and concussion protocol back then, so. And he got down his four point stance and they hiked the ball and he just shot right through, like I got the guy for like a three yard loss. And then got up and kind of like still dazed, went off the field. Right. And I was like, "Wow!" I was like, you know, "Did you see that?" Like, I was told, we were at the game. Like, told you see what Goldberg just did. So, uh, so that's how tough he was, you know. And um, so when he went to play pro football, I didn't think he just showed up at the day, showed up at TV at, at TV one day with Luger. I was like, "All right, you think you're, you're doing this?" I was like, "He was like, he's like, yeah, I'm thinking of doing this, you know." And stuff. He didn't really love. He didn't love wrestling. He he loved football. You know, he was a football player. That just became got. He was as good at. Getting a pop in wrestling, he was good. You know that that crowd when when he it was just different. Whenever Goldberg would come out to wrestle, just that, that arena just was different. It was like wow, this guy's coming out to he, Goldberg's coming out to kill somebody. You know, it wasn't like you know wrestling. Yeah. You know, and uh, but we were always cool. But just one day, I, I never one day I was always cool with him. You know, never did issue. But I didn't really hang out with him at the shows or nothing. But uh. But I just remember one day when he was in, the, they were in the meeting where they had to bring in Brad Siegel and he was meeting with Russo and stuff and those guys. And he wanted, they wanted him to do a job at Scott Steiner. And I remember I opened the door and he was so pissed from like, I guess he was arguing with these guys. He was like, shut the goddamn door. And I was like, Jesus. Like he never talked to me like that before. Yeah. You know, and I was like, wow, he must be hot. You know, so, yeah. yeah. But, uh, I'd, yeah, I'd, I'd, I was a huge fan of his, you know. And it, it just, um, plus each time we worked him, I worked him. We always had good. We, we did good stuff with it. We put him over big, you know. And it was. Uh, I'll never. I'll never forget when Johnny Ace took over. When Johnny Ace was doing the finishes, and he came in, and he was like doing all all the Goldberg's finishes and matches and stuff. And I remember like he wanted to do a handicap match against against me and Alex. We were over in England. And um. <clears throat> uh, like Johnny Ace said, set it up, and I, I didn't. I didn't like it. It was just like it was just a squash. But I'm like, I like, do. We can be. This can be more entertaining if we do it logically, you know, instead of anything like instead of just a straight, you know. And like, you know, we did a deal where like, if you watch this, it's uh, it's, it's it's really entertaining. It's, it's before he gets in the ring, and so we kind of jump out of the ring. You know, we're scared, of him. And we're kind of circling, trying to sneak up on him. You know, and we do a thing where like, a, you know, one of us distracts, the other one slides in. You know, boom, boom, and uh, like he. I attack him, he hits me, but Alex now is climbed up on the top rope. And Johnny wanted Alex to drop kick him, missile drop kick him off the top rope, but didn't want Bill to take a bump. And I'm like, D -d -d I'm like, come on, Johnny. I go, this kid's this 240 pounds. I go, let's do for a shoot. You know, he's gonna knock him down. Big deal. So he didn't have to don't have to kill him. I go, all you're doing is knocking a guy down, but we're doing a missile drop kick off the top rope. Yeah. So he knocks him down. And we kinda like boom 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 get a little heat on him. And we do his spot we shoot him because it's double spears, double jackhammer, but it was just real exciting, right? And when we came back afterwards, uh, Bill was like, "Yeah, he was good. That that worked. He goes, he goes you, you, that was right. You know, that was good. I like that. You know." And Johnny Ace even came over and said, "That that he goes, you, 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 your way was better." And I was like, "You know, I go, yeah, we put him over, but it's like he shouldn't. Like he just can't go in there and kill everybody without ever like you know, like ever, anybody ever. You know what I'm saying? There's there's, 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 no, there's no depth to uh, a guy just slaughtering everybody at any time. You know, like the people pop when Mike Tyson would kill people." But the people pop bigger when Mike Tyson got beat, you know, or go showed showed you know chinks in his armor, you know. Yeah. So, at what point did you become friends with Conan back there? Um, just organically, kind of right away, maybe a little bit, because uh, we kind of like um, we all had similar interests, and we kind of like uh, kind of started. 
maybe we were hanging out before this, but when 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 Nash and Hall came in, we kind of like Nash and Hall like we we were all you could tell like 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 Nash didn't like the like a lot of the the, the he didn't like the older guys, he liked the younger guys, you know. And we were like he liked he liked the, the younger guy vibe, and I kind of like uh, me and Conan and Ray and Kim and everything, you know. We kind of like uh, we we thought Nash was cool. We started hanging out with you know Nash, but me and Conan and, and, and Ray and we were all. Ray, Raven and all of us, we all just kind of like, just had similar interests. It doesn't really like, um, it's just weird. Just so, you know, I, I can't really pinpoint a, a time when it started, but I just noticed that all of us were, were hanging out, you know? And then we started driving. I, I would always drive the Mexican guys. I would drive like him and Hoovy and, and Ray and me. Right. And it was like, oh yeah. <laughs> it was just like, it's so funny too, because like, you know, they're always late and it would be a joke, like when I'd want to leave. I'd always like say like hey I give him like hey but let's, let's let's if we want to leave at like eight thirty in the morning hey meet me there at eight fifteen all right all right they wouldn't show up you know <laughs> so uh, so then become be eight thirty be eight o'clock and meet meet at eight you know and then be, they wouldn't still you know eight still late you know even even late past eight thirty <laughs> I'd like tell them, like like forty five minutes an hour before I wanted to meet yeah. tell them that to get them there to show up at the time that I that I, that I wanted to meet but uh. But we just, um, yeah, we did a lot of miles together on the, on the road and stuff, like you're driving. They, 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 were, they were cool. I, I mean, I, I always used to like uh, like the Mexican gang, gang you know, click. And did so, you yeah. see uh, any of Ruby's incidents that took place? Where oh, it? yeah. I was, I was right there the, when he was naked in Australia. <laughs> that was <laughs> that freaking, was that was weird, there. man. It was like, uh, you got to picture the scene. Um, it, there was, there was, everybody was out the night before, and I had, like, gone out... And like they went somewhere else. I don't know what what happened. Like, cause you back then we'd meet people. Hey, let's go to this club. You know, I'll see you guys at this other club. And some guys would just go. You know, like to be yeah. girls. You know, and stuff. Hey, we went with these girls to this other club. And uh, they had um, uh, they had like gone out. I think I stayed in. Maybe or maybe I went out. We got we got in early, right? And I'll just never forget this. It's it's, it's a Marriott. And picture like the like if you, there's a Marriott and on the end of the Marriott is a, is a Marriott restaurant, but it's like a big windows everywhere. To Dallas, you know, it's like glass everywhere. It's like, it's one of those things where you see the outside where you're sitting in the restaurant. I'll never forget, there's a bunch of old ladies, like in flowery dresses, <laughs> eating breakfast in the morning and everything. And there's Hoovy outside. He's like arguing with Conan and, Ho and Ray over something. Like, what the frick is going on? And they're arguing. And Hoovy just takes his clothes off. And he's just screaming at the top of his lungs, and he's like, you know, and they're like, it's Hoovy, the, the settler. He's like freaking out. And I guess like he had like uh, been with um, uh, been with some um, uh, like some guys in the club, and they, they were smoking angel dust or something. He didn't know it, and like you know, he was all messed up. And uh, I'll never forget this. <clears throat> Is that uh, the um. The cops showed up. The cops showed up, obviously, because there's a naked guy screaming at the top of his lungs, um, freaking out, and there was like five of them. Okay, and uh, like when they tried to to subdue him, it was like I've, I've never seen anything like this. It's like he had like he had like superhuman strength because Hoovy's not a big guy, you know. Right. And they tried to grab him, and he was like slinging people off, and so like they were on top of like he, they, they couldn't. He's a little guy. Yeah. Every single person trying to get him was like, but like de decent sized guys, they couldn't. And like finally, one of the guys came and like had to like tackle the whole pile to get him on the ground. And you, he's a he's a small guy. You literally had like they they had him pinned down to the ground with his face on the cement, like with the four, like literally like like four to five guys holding him down. And it looked like 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 if I'm holding one arm, yeah. all right, and I'm just one guy holding one arm. I'm struggling holding one arm. Like they could not keep him down. He was like fighting. Like I was like, how is? <laughs> it looked like a, so like a like a superhero scene. Like 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 where's he getting the strength from? Yeah. You know. And they, they they finally like he was screaming at the top of his lungs the whole time. This in Spanish. You know, I couldn't understand a word he was saying. But uh, and everybody was like, just just man. I forget who was out there. Conan and Ray were out there, and they were like, Shh, this is bad. You know, like. I'm like, what the frick is going on here? You know, it, was, it was the weirdest scene. I've, I've never seen anything like it. And they put him in a, they, they got him finally in the paddy wagon. It took forever. Um, but he was like, just, he would not, like, little hoovy, naked, 
Yeah. And they try to pick. Yeah, it's, it was just a weird. Oh, oh my god, <laughs> bro. Let me tell you something. That would have been the most. That that would have gotten. 30 million views right? <laughs> today. They would have seen it. Yeah, but, but, but back then, yeah. Oh, if cell phones were around back then, forget it. We, we would, we, we actually probably would have probably like let up a lot more than we did. But we, we used to get too wild back then. You know, with, if, did you ever see any of Flair's antics? I mean, like this not for, no. You know, I always heard he, 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 the, the, Flair would just buy people drinks at the bar a lot. I, I saw that, you know, but I wouldn't see him like, you know, whipping his dick out or anything. I never saw that. Yeah. You know, so I'd heard that I'd heard it happened. You know, so, but I did like we we were there because the flare flare would stay at the bar. You know, at the hotel bar, we'd always yeah. go out. So I think, and then it happened like you know, we but me and him were always cool. So, but yeah, I never, I never, I never firsthand visualized anything other than flare buying drinks for for everybody in the bar. And you had some matches with Buff Bagwell. Mm -hmm. uh, what are your thoughts on that? And why is he so disliked? Because he's got a uh, my my match with him were always fine. You know, we we always worked good together because we were, we were friendly with each other. We we draw. He was he's easily top three. If you want to drive with somebody and have somebody tell you some fantastic, like he he's a great storyteller. Like the way he tells stories, it, he's an incredible storyteller. Like stories of his life, stories of upbringing, stories where he shot his dad. You know stuff like the, all these these stories. It's just I mean it's like wow. This this guy really had a really incredible strange upbringing you know what i'm saying and he did so i loved driving with him because he would always just tell stories all the time you know but uh and we always had good matches because we we're always friends we drive we're friendly you know we we take care of each other but um he admits that he's an a1 personality hey it's me first you know and if you know that you're entertained by it because yeah. like you see a guy kind of living a gimmick of like kind of like the the, the the old lex and him were identical they're both narcissists on TV, and they're both whether they're, they're for shoot narcissists in real life, they're working it all the time around everybody, even the boys. And a lot of the guys rub them the wrong way, but you know this. But like you're entertained by it because they're so over the top, you know. <laughs> it's like it'd be funny, like like Buff would like uh, we'd be going out that night, and Buff would call me to his room. All right, okay, I go down his room. He goes, you see this? I, I go and he have he'd have his outfit laid out on the bed. He goes, you see what I'm doing here? He goes, this is what I'm wearing tonight. I put it out and I, I, you know, I have it ready and like just, just see, see what it looks like and I envision myself. <laughs> that's you do, do funny stuff like that, you know? He, him and uh, him and Luger, like uh, we go to their hotel room. You know, they, they'd stay together sometimes and like two or three of us would go there before we go out. They'd have a 12 pack of beer. They're drinking beer and they're, the, the, the freezer door is open. And I'm like, what are you guys doing? So they go, oh, we always stand next to the freezer because this is how we stay cool before we go out. <laughs> you know, like the refrigerator freezer door open. They just like to be standing there next to it, drink, drinking beer with the, the cool air. <laughs> They're very peculiar. Like, like I said, guys, that would rub people the wrong way. But like, I'm just entertained by watching how these guys act. You know, they were they were, they were two of my favorite guys because if they liked you, they would they would they would do stuff like this with you. You know stuff. If they didn't like you, they would just shut you out. They, they wouldn't. They would ignore it. If you, if they ignored you, they they, they don't care to. You know, they don't want anything to do with you. They don't like you. Yeah. But if they were like, if they let, if they would play their gimmick around you, they liked you because you knew you would. You'd buy. You you you'd entertain them by by letting them entertain you. You, you know what I'm saying? So. I was always cool with him. Is the gigolo thing a work with him or? I don't know. I I've, I've never. I, I, it's been a while since I talked to him. You know, his his wife was my um my old roommate's uh roommate before before uh like like his wife was my ex roommate's roommate before I was my ex roommate's roommate. And they were so I, I knew her. She was from the gym and stuff and all that. So uh if he's a jiggle <laughs> like as a as a shoot, I don't know. These days you don't know what's a work and what's a shoot. You know yeah. so they, I I guess he's on the website. Yeah. Cowboys did like you could like, you know, I, I, but but that show, I know that show is kinda like a half work, half shoot. Yeah. Because it's in Vegas, and I know some of the you know they came to our club one time, and it's kind of like they're kind of working. You know, you know what I'm saying? It's yeah. like I don't, I don't the real. What is a reality show these days? Yeah. It's, it's a show that's reality TV, but reality TV is really we're working the reality. You know, so. But uh, I don't. I I don't know. I've not heard. I've not talked to him about about it, and I've never. You know, I don't know anybody that's actually 
procured his services <laughs> or, you yeah. know, so I did you just hear about it and you're like, I can see him doing that, you know what I'm saying? So let's see hundred percent, yeah. You don't hear about him wrestling too much these days, so that's why I wonder. May maybe. I mean like you know <laughs> That's funny though. <laughs> And you had some matches with Scott Hall. Uh, what mm -hmm. was he like? Oh, he's he's great. He 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 basically got me paid in okay. WCW. He got me paid. He would uh, <clears throat> they would. He, you gotta understand, like back in WCW, the back then you've heard the stories. Just the inmates ran the asylum. Yeah. They would give Scott something to do that night, and Scott used to like to use Louis Piccoli. Okay, it's like his because Scott was smart because Scott didn't want to take all the bumps. He would have a guy, the, the guy that we kind of knew what he was doing to, to take the bumps, you know? Yeah. So Scott would have this, like, Louis Piccoli. So when Louis, Louis Piccoli, you know, like, when he passed, um, they would give Scott stuff to do on TV. He would come to me, like, I don't forget, he just came to me. He said, hey, you want to do this spot with me tonight? And I'm like, uh, yeah, sure. And he goes, so he'd go back to the office. He goes, hey, I'm doing this. The disco's going to do this with me. That's how much stroke these guys had. Yeah. They never, when I was doing my whole thing with the NWO, where I was doing with Scott and stuff and everything, they never really started, like, it took like five to six weeks before they actually included me in like the, <laughs> the thing that Scott was doing. Right. Scott would get what he was doing and just say, come to me and say, hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use you and I'm gonna go tell him. <laughs> like, so Scott was booking me into his angles with him. Yeah. Okay, and, that, and that's how it all started. I mean, like, Integrating myself in the NWO because I was Scott's like you know Scott I was like Scott's Louis Piccoli guy I would yeah. go out there and like just, just do the spots and be, be out there with him and stuff and everything all that and I'll never forget because like uh, th during this time is the time my contract negotiations coming around you know and it's like I, I was gonna ask for a certain amount of money but now I'm getting them and the NWO I'm like I'm on TV with Scott Hall we're we're, we're beating Goldberg. For the first time, and I'm part of the match, you know, like like where Goldberg's giving me, and I'm like, I, I wouldn't ask for way more money. Yeah. And they gave it to me, you know. <laughs> so, it's, so it's like you know, and that's all because Scott Hall was just like booking me, and I'm becoming a more prominent character on TV because of him specifically was was doing that for me wow. because he knew I knew I because he knew I had, I, I had a good mind for the business, and I'll never forget like when when it got to the point where uh uh there was a big schmaz flare the the four horsemen. Hogan, Macho, Hall, Nash, and me, right? And we're 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 in the the, the thing, the, the the booking, the the meeting there. There's probably ten of us, right? And they're trying to lay this spot out, and um and none none of the guys can figure out what to do. And I just like I, I just saw I I mean I you know like when you can they're trying to and you just see it in your mind like oh well, let's just just do this you know what I'm saying? And I just raised my hand and went like you know just just laid it out and like Hogan's like I like that uh, let's do, let's do that let's do that. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. And then when we got out of the meetings, like, see, you know, Kevin and Scott were kind of leaving me like, hey, hey good, good job, you know, because now these guys look at me like, hey, I, I, you know, I'm not just some guy, some schmuck. This guy's using out there. I was like, hey, I actually can, you know, I know what I'm doing. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But then that's the thing that a lot of the mid card guys never really got to integrate with that, you know, all the top guy stuff and everything. So, but that was a, uh, but yeah, Scott, Scott, I don't know why he did it, but just one day at TV. Hey, you want to do this? I got an idea for you to do this spot. And it's funny, they're, they're like, they're, I wouldn't be on the sheet. I wouldn't even match. I yeah. thought I'd be going home and go, hey, Scott, Scott would be like, hey, what, what a, come here, let's, just, I'm gonna, let's do this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use you. Let's go tell them. Oh, forget, yeah. It's like, it's, 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 but, but back then, that's how it was. Guys would just do, do what they wanted. You know, yeah. they're like, okay, go ahead. Because they're doing good business. You know? It's like, yeah. Did you have much interaction with Hulk Hogan back there? No. I was not the thing was I wasn't a, the, the, I've grown to appreciate him more as I've gotten older but I was not a fan of Hulk when I was in WCW because the, here's the, this was just a, the, this is my opinion okay and this is why I didn't I didn't like like what he stood for in that he always used to talk about the team you know what I'm saying like he, we gotta make sure this guy's on the team you know this, this guy's got a team he always talked about the team but like he had his own locker room and stuff and everything and all that. Yeah. And I was that that, that that just rubbed me the wrong. It just rubbed person. I just didn't. I didn't like that. You know what I'm saying? Like you're talking about the team. Like well, you know, Hall and Nash are in the locker room with the boys. You know, but like all these guys talking about team. Like, well, if we're a team, why you guys got well, guys have your own locker rooms? So that's not a. That's and that was really the only issue I had like with, with Hulk with that. Like I didn't like him using the, the the team concept when you basically are just got your own. You're off on your own. You're above everybody. 
You know what I mean? That that's the, I, I didn't like that. But I've got like a, one thing about him uh, that I've I've grown to appreciate is that and like and like seeing the way some some of the people have kind of turned on him later in life is that he was very loyal to people that were close to him. You know, he got he got people that were friends. You know, his friends. He yeah. he, he would go to bat for them and get them work. Yeah, that's true. You know, I mean, like, so I'm like, well, what are you going to do? Like, well, how, if you're an outsider looking at that, you're kind of like, oh, well, he's just, you know, but if you're part of that, I, I wish I would have had more, you know, the, I, yeah. I don't know, I mean, if I was that rich and I had that much stroke, I would probably take care of guys like Hogan did too that, that I liked. Yeah. You know, when and said, hey, dude, dude, pay this guy, you know, yeah. pay him, I'll be, let's keep him. Let's, 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 let's keep, you know what I'm saying? I, I would probably do that too. And I, I think that's a, uh, a quality that people probably like of Hogan probably criticized for a long time. That if you really step back and looked at it, you you were in his shoes, you probably you you admire that. Yeah. You know, then that's that's the way I look at Hulk Hogan today, especially the way he's been demonized over the years. You know, and I'm like, wow, he's you know, he he really took a beating, you know, with with when, when his son got got in trouble, and like he was he was you know he would defend his son, and the like, people and like, bro, the guy's defending his son. It's like, you know what I mean? What would you expect of a dad to do? I mean, this this is crazy that we are trying to like you know like bury Hulk Hogan for for, for thing. But what are you gonna, what are you gonna, you gonna disown your kid? Yeah. You know that's, what kind of father is that? You know, and I, I I grew to appreciate like the way he he carried himself in that. You know. And what were your overall feelings of Eric Bischoff? He was a. Uh, um, he was kind of he was he was kind of a condescending guy, but I could see like he was very when, like when I first started there and I was first starting do, coming to like production meetings, I could tell that he was like a he was frustrated like he he'd been a product of a guy that was frustrated with the production process there, like his vision was not was you know you don't know say like his vision was not getting like there was like a, a disconnect a little bit between him and like the, the what what they could what the production could do right. you know, but um he was kind of a, a, you know. He's a he's a he's a boss, you know. People either love the boss, hate the boss, and you know, or there's mixed. You love him, you hate him, or you're in the middle and stuff and all that. And uh, you know, he fired me, but I can see where like, if, if I was in his shoes, I probably would have done the same thing. If that's what I have to do. If I tell a talent to do something, they you know, they say no. What am I supposed to do? You know. Yeah. But uh, he, um, I think he was a product of uh, <clears throat> the last guy. The reason the, here's the reason I think. That a lot of the problems had at WCW is, is um, the last guy that would get his ear. That's what would get on TV, and that's why a lot of the things plans would change all the way up to like ten minutes before the show starts. Right. You know what I'm saying? So I think like, the thing was is I think that um, you know Eric's not he he wasn't like the most creative. He was he was a big picture creative guy. Like it's not a big thing, but like like details and stuff. Anything? I, I don't you know. I, I don't think he cared a lot about a lot of stuff, but I've heard Vince McMahon is the same way. You know, when when, when the attitude era was going, you know, all Vince want to know is well, what's Austin doing tonight. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I think Eric kind of thing. Well, what's Hogan doing tonight? What's the NWO doing tonight? You know, and uh, and he's kind of kind of the same way. But I mean, he was he's a smart guy. You know, he's very intelligent. Um, just for all the money he made off of WCW. Just alone. I mean, just, just but but I'm saying he he knows like, when you speak with him. Like and you, you like you hear his podcast today and stuff. He's just very, very, very smart. Like you could tell he's got a high IQ. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But like a, he's not the best people person. You know, he's a little bit. He's 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 uh, probably unintentionally condescending at times to people. You know, but that's just probably just just the way his personality is. But um, I, I've like I have no problems with the guy. You know, so. How did you feel when uh, Vince Russo and Ed Ferrer uh, were uh, brought over? Well, we thought that they were going to like to, to turn things, go help the mid card guys, which is what they did. Yeah. You know, I mean, they came in, and immediately they just like if you're on the card, we're trying to put you in a storyline, no matter what who you are. If you're on the show or if you're part of the roster, we got to give you a storyline. And it was just different because like, you know, WCW, we weren't shooting backstage back then before they came in. So now we had to produce stuff backstage because that's the way they did in New York. You know yeah. what I'm saying? So it just changed the whole culture of how shows are written today, and that's how how they are written today. You know, the, the camera's just there, and we just shoot like the suspension disbelief, knowing that the cameras the cameras there. And we just uh, they um, 
Ed was funny. So me and Conan and Ed and stuff, we, we, we hit it off, you know, immediately. Uh, Russo, um, I, got to, I sat next to him on a plane one time, and we just started picking each other's brains for like a two-hour trip. And a couple weeks later, they asked me to sit on booking meetings. So we was just he had, in coach, huh? Was he in coach? Was yeah, he was in coach. Yeah, really they had to play. Yeah, we were. We were the. I'll never forget. We were the first seat behind first class, sitting right there. And it was a. Uh, um, I think he was like a standby or something, and he came and said, there was, one, "There was one empty seat right next to me." and He sat next to me, okay. and we just started picking. We just picked our brains for like two hours. You know, we had, we had, we had identical views on the business. You know, that like the show is a two hours of TV. You can do whatever you want. You know what I'm saying? It's not, you don't have to pigeonhole yourself into wrestling. You can just do whatever you want for two hours of television. There's no, there's no rule book, you know? Yeah. So we, we thought the same way. And so the next thing you know, he's asked me to sit on booking meetings. So. And how did you like that? Um, this, this is fun. It's me, Ted, Eric, uh, me, Ed, Terry, Taylor, uh, Borash would sit in, Bill Banks sometimes would sit in, but, uh, and Vince, and it was just, it's just funny because they were fun sometimes. Uh, when you get brighter's block, it's not fun. You know, there were periods of time where you'd just be like literally just sitting there for three, everybody's just in silence. You can't, you can't really think of nothing. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. You're just sitting there and, uh, and I was funny too because like I was, I was comedic. Um, <clears throat> like I'll never forget this one time. It's like, I've told this story a million times, but like I'll tell it again. We're sitting there for like, you know, two straight minutes since nobody's thinking of anything. And I'm like, I'm like, how about this? Let's shoot a shot of an empty locker room for 30 seconds. And at the end, coming soon, the invisible man. <laughs> and bro, they just, everybody just popped. And like we'd laugh. And like everybody crack up. And then we just start throwing weird stuff out there. And you just start like, you know, start talking about weird And then you just start get, get back in, like, you know, start getting back into booking the show. Or just like, you know, I was an outside the box stinker. I just, I'd always come, and I wouldn't necessarily want these on the show, but I would just think crazy stuff, like funny stuff, just to pop the room. Because yeah. once you start laughing, you just start thinking differently. You just start thinking comedy, and then like you start thinking comedy, then you start thinking funny stuff you do, then you turn them into serious stuff. Just, you know, just start, it's just, it just sparks, sparks your intelligence, you know? Sparks your creative thought. Were you paid extra for that? Nah. No. But, no, no, well, sort of. They started giving my, um, when we travel, because here's the thing, I come home, from the road and it was right around the corner from my house we'd meet at a hotel in a conference room and the meeting would take like six seven hours right and they'd feed us and stuff but but i was getting my um they started paying for my cars and and, and rooms on the road okay okay so t theoretically that adds up you know what i'm saying like they're paying, they're paying me to go to a booking meeting for uh, you know six hours and i'm getting the equivalent of maybe like i don't know maybe a thousand Twelve to fifteen hundred bucks worth of extra stuff every, every week that, that that would be paying for, or, or you know so. So that that was like I guess it was I, I guess I did make more, you know because now I was getting office amenities and stuff. So. Did you get any heat backstage from jealous wrestlers? No, no, not not heat. The only time I got heat was when, like, one of the guys did Chavo didn't like an angle one time and started yelling at me in front of everybody, and like but he came and apologized to me afterwards. But uh. But um, no, they liked it because they knew I would I would go I was going to bat for the mid card guys, like I was I was talking I was, I was with the guys. Like, hey, I'm gonna ask if I can do this with you guys, you know? And I'd throw stuff out there trying to try and because they were my friends, you know. Like, people, well, they're not my friends. They were kind of my peers. Yeah. Like they're all mid card guys, and I know they're not doing nothing with you. Hey, what you know? Hey, I would you know tell Vince D -d -d try try this with this guy. Yeah. You know, try try this with this guy. Try let this guy do this. Is this guy's entertaining? You know, or do you give Ernest Miller the mic. You know what I'm saying? He, this guy can talk. He can run his mouth. Go, yeah. go, just give him the mic and let him go. You know, and they, they start doing it, and uh, just just stuff like that. So then, then nobody, nobody really. Uh, I, if, if I had heat, nobody ever came and told me, "Hey, you got a lot of heat for doing this." Right. You know, because I wasn't booking myself in anything spectacular. You know, so I was just like, I was just trying to help out. You know, I was just trying to like, I was a buffer in between like bid card guys that they really didn't know anything about because they never interacted with these people, and and like Vince and Ed, so. Now, one last guy I'll ask you about from WCW is a controversial guy that I guess would have been one of the mid-card guys you might have helped, and that's Bill DeMott, mm -hmm. who was what, General Erection. Yeah. Um, 
What was he like? What do you think of all the controversy that happened with him? Oh, pfft. I mean, it's just, bro, it's, it's the, the stuff from the from the, 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 the WB. Yeah. Me and Bill got along great. Always have. Funny, funny guy. Crack each other up. Oh, you know, he was, this was his, his gimmick was a shoot, you know, laughing man. He, he had a great laugh. Yeah. And he was always funny. It was always easy to, always easy to pop. But, um, you know, I don't know what, what they did there. Like, I mean, I'm, I'll be honest with you. I, I got lucky when I got trained. I didn't get abused or, or nothing like that. I, I, cause I picked up stuff really fast, you know, but I know there's a culture that exists in professional wrestling that you kind of got to be tough. And it's like, how do you teach toughness? Unless you expose people to uncomfortable situations, sometimes, you know, because that's that's all that toughens you up is when you when you're exposed to something that you, you don't know how to re, you know you, you re, it cause you react a certain way, you know, saying like you don't you, you it makes you angry, it makes you uncomfortable, it makes you you know how how do you take that, you know? So I've I've always thought that like you know I've I've never been kind of abusive, but I've seen like trainers, I've seen YouTube clips of. Like how the Japanese train them and stuff, and they train their guys like they're abusing. Them. And I'm like, I'm like, hey, it's like you know this to do this business. You know, we're stressing our bodies, and there's really no, there's never been a rule book written on how to like like the, show me a rule book, a universal rule book on how to train a professional wrestler. There's a million trainers out there with varying degrees of experience. You know, basically it's just like people in the business are sharing their knowledge of what they think works. With people and trying to teach them the way maybe they've been taught, yeah. you know. So I was just like, if if you if you think that you're being abused by the you know, the professional wrestling business or the you're abused in training or being abused and your feelings are hurt, it's like it's like try going out there like like you know your back hurts, you can't get out of bed, um, you got to take a bunch of pills just to be able to make it to the ring. To get through a night of work to get paid, okay? How do you train somebody for that situation? They have you know, to love it. <laughs> they 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 have to love it, but they have to be able to handle the abuse of your body. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? You got to be able to handle uncomfortable situations. You got to be able to handle being f like you you feel, you know you 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 don't feel strong about yourself. You yeah. feel weak. So how do like if they if you're getting You'll beat down verbally or whatever. How do you react? Do you suck it up and do you, or do you just? I can't believe he's treating me like this. You know, or do you get depressed? Because a similar, the only similar situation you're going to have is when you're hurt, and you have to work to get paid. How do you train people for that? You know. Right. So anytime people criticize, you know, the, the, the training of methods of people, I've always said you just don't know this. This business might not be for you. Because this is the type of things you might have to deal with if, if you if you do this for a living. You know what I'm saying? Having to work when you're hurt to get paid. You know? And it's like if that's if you don't if you're not willing to do that, if you're not willing to suffer, you know, this might not be the business for you. And that's what I would say to, I would say to people, you know. Now you've already talked about what you did after uh, WCW went out of business. Um, but just to go into WCW actually going out of business, were you shocked or did you see it coming? Being part of the no, we didn't because Brad Siegel came in and told us like a couple months before we got sold that we weren't getting sold. It's just lied, we had a whole meeting and lied right to our faces. So we never thought that, that was that was an option. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And it's like I was, I was at the point and there was a part of my career too where it's was like, oh, this is cool. My next contract, I'm going to get a, a, a good bump. You know, and I'm gonna be able to get a nice house and everything. My next deal is gonna be, I'm gonna make a million bucks. You know what I'm saying? And uh, so that was like, wow, we, we are out of business. Holy cow, how did how that happen? I, I, I was envisioning this next year to be completely different than, than this. You yeah. know what I'm saying? So when it, when, it, when it went out of business, I was like, man, I was just like, it's, it's, it hits you pretty hard, but I was still getting paid for like, you know, so that, okay, I got, I got three months to figure it out. What I'm gonna do, but I'm getting paid a good chunk of change during that time. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, so it was like, it wasn't like, you know what I'm saying? Like I got, like, like I got chopped off. You know what I mean? Yeah. So. And you ended up uh, after your contract mm -hmm. uh, expired and everything, going to TNA. Mm -hmm. um, was it Jeff Jarrett that brought you in there, or Vince Russo? Or? Jeff, Vince, they were, you know, and um, 
that 2003 in TNA was the best work I ever did. The, those, those shows were some of the best TV that never got seen because they were their weekly pay. You had to pay for it right. on every week, so not a lot of people watched it. You know, yeah. but if they if you look at that if you look at if that that library of shows for like from from 2003 to 2000 you know mid 2004, those were great shows. We we were we were running the same building every week, right? And there was times where we're like, wow, this this is good. Sh this is really good stuff. The houses, even though it's a local market, you know, there's a lot of people. Like the houses growing every week, we're yeah. packed every week now. There's people. What, there's, there's a line outside. They're turning away people at the door, and just the shows were very strong. They were like, we had a lot of. It was one of those periods of time where you had a young AJ Styles, a young Chris Daniels, a young Chris Sabin, a young, like all these these young guys that are great, that were just now getting exposed to people. And like, wow, these guys are really really good. You know, you're watching them. Like, holy cow. The work was great. The interviews were fantastic. I mean, like every guy in the car just just nailed it on the mic. Like each night, it was just a, uh, it was just good stuff, man. I, I I really enjoyed. That was the funnest time I had. Is, is 2003 in TNA, because it was just like it was, it was just good stuff, man. I mean, if if you, if you get to if you ever get a chance to watch, you'd be like, wow, this is like, these are like really good shows, you know. So. Who do you think owns that footage now? It's still TNA. It's at the Glo TNA. They, they, it's on this. You can get it on that on that app. Okay. All those shows are on that that uh, a global wrestling app, whatever it's called, um, that that Impact app or something like. All the all those archive shows are on there. Those are. Uh, I was just told me like like New Jack used to come and do great interviews. You know? So yeah. I mean like Shane Douglas, uh, Sam I've heard Man. Vince you know, Russo say the same thing that those were the best. Oh, they were just. I mean, if you just watch, it was just, we were we were doing outside the box stuff. I was cutting good promos. Sand. Everybody was. I mean, it was just like wow. It's like wow. If you watch those, if you watch those shows, you're like, what happened to like you know? Because it wasn't scripted back then. You know, Vince would write write interviews, but he'd write them very basic and like elementary, and you put your words in and fit. You know, you you edit it in your voice any way you want. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's like uh, so you just got guys just everybody was giving good direction, and they were go rolling with it. And the angles were good. Everything was hot. It was just it was just good stuff, man. I was I. I, I I put those that was as good TV as as you will see you know because everything made sense it was outside the box but we made it make sense and stuff it was just good Mike Tenay's announcing was fantastic like he would sell the angles just it was just great stuff yeah did you deal at all with uh, Jerry Jarrett at the beginning briefly I didn't I want I want a fan of his I want I want a, I want a fan of his um, he uh, <clears throat> um. He like had ideas for angles that I just thought were way too, way too old school. Just would not get over, you know, and stuff. And like he then I'd be like, I just I just don't think he you know I mean, the guy's probably brilliant back in the back in the day, but like it's it's, it's like not 1981 anymore. You know what I'm saying? It's not, and, uh, and plus he made a comment about me. Um, like he he had wondered. Like I, I, there was a period of time where the, they were trying to sign me or something. I didn't want to. I didn't want to work there because I wanted not want enough and stuff. And his thing was like, why? Why would? Because you know he he did Memphis television. Yeah. So he would have guys come work on TV for for, for twenty dollars. You know. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's what they do. They you they put you on TV, and that's that's like your exposure, right? Right. And he didn't understand that. Like you know, I don't understand why a guy would want to be on TV though. So and I'm like. And Jerry, I just spent seven years on TV. <laughs> it's not about being yeah. on TV anymore. It's about the, your money. You know what I'm saying? So that, that's 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 like where he hit his, his school of thought and my school of thought clashed. It's like I'm not I don't I don't need to be on TV anymore. I was on TV for seven years. You know every week. So that like, you know so, so I don't need more TV exposure. I just want more money. You know? Yeah. yeah. So that's. What was the friction with him and Jeff over? Was that just Jerry getting out of the bro? Building? I have no idea. I, I I'll tell you what. Here's what I heard is that. All I know is Jeff. This is this is a very weird dynamic, right? Is and I don't know if it's true or not, but this, this was a story that I heard that, that, that uh, for some reason, like Jerry Jared never held Jeff's kids in his arms, right? But Jeff confided in him, and it, like they would go be off in the corner meeting all the, all the time, you know. So the, the, there were confidence. Like the, I guess Jeff would always go to you know ask him, you know. Jeff was a student of the game, which made Jeff so so smart to the business. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Jeff Jeff is Jeff's as, as smart a cook as you will find in professional wrestling. You know what I'm saying? He's he's just just he's just, just smarter than everybody else, you know? And um I think what happened was is 
the friction came on, on when he felt when Jerry Jarrett had that Russian character guy and he like went Holy to New Purdue. Yeah, and he went to New York with with him like like yeah. and I think this this is cuz it's still sketchy in my memory, but I think that rubbed Jeff the wrong way. It's like, well, you know, it's kind of like you're backstabbing me here with this guy. Why why are you taking him to New York, you know? I, and I'd heard that was that was a story that created a lot of friction with them. I, I never knew the story because he wouldn't, he would never repeat his conversations that he had with his father. Never. I, I, didn't, I had no clue what they were talking about. That's the thing. Be open and read, like, I never like, I, I, I had no clue what they're talking about, you know? I can tell you why I took him to New York though because I knew Oleg because he didn't like wrestling and right. he, he got a better than average training contract. Right. So oh, probably, is that what it was? Right, right. He probably wouldn't have been willing to uh, wrestle for a small amount right. of money. Did you hear the similar story? I didn't hear the story, but I, I just knew Oleg that he didn't really like re wrestling. He right. was only in it for the money reasons. Right. So. That's, yeah, that's, I mean, that's the sketch. I, but I don't know any, if it's... I could see how that would cause friction. Yeah. It's just, so, that, that's too, it's like, and I don't know, um, I just don't, I just don't know, because I never really knew, I just knew Jeff confided in him, but I never knew what they talked about, you know? Right. He never shared those conversations or nothing, you know? And Dixie Carter, I have to ask you about her and your dealings with her, of course. I liked her. I mean, she was always cool with me. I, I honestly think, I think she, I, I think she's a lot smarter than people think. I think she made some mistakes, okay, but, you know, big deal. What promoter hasn't made mistakes and, in, 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 you know, whatever. Um, she, she was, of course, was a mark, but I think that she smartened herself up a lot faster than people give her credit for. Because a lot of guys, a lot of the stories I hear about Dixie are that, you know, how dishonest she was and dealings and stuff and everything and all that. And I'm like, I'm, look, I like, she had to know from the get-go that she was being worked by a lot of these guys and probably said to herself, all right, I'm just going to start working them back. Yeah. Because she's not, she's not dumb. She would have known that. Like, I, I, I can see that happening because she would have known that. You know what I'm saying? Because she would have known when she she's not not, you know the the boys, you know Jeff and the, they would try to work her, you know. But you can't, you when you assume somebody is dumber than they are, they can. I think they see it, and I think they turn the tables, yeah, and just start doing it back, and like that's and you just get that. And I think it just created that culture there, where maybe everybody thought they were working Dixie, but you know what? Dixie was kind of like working you guys back, you know what I'm saying? So like, and, and in retrospect, he kind of, that, that to me is, is kind of like the vibe that I, that I see that, that went on there. Because she was not dumb. She's a very, she's a smart girl. Yeah. Smart woman. You know, she, she's, not, she's not a dumb cookie. She's smart. And what do you think of the current uh, Impact Wrestling regime and uh, what they've done so far? Well, the more, uh, they've, done, they've, done, they've done well so far. I mean, like, they, you know, my understanding is, is uh, you know, the Fight TV people can't be, they're not WWE, but they can be, all right, everything other than WWE. And when you do that, it's kind of like what they're doing now, and I like what, what, what Don and, 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 and Deborah are getting people to do it. They're getting all these other companies to just work with each other. You know, kind of like, like, you know, the, you know, like the Marvel Infinity Wars is coming out, and that's kind of like marrying all the universes, you know, and everybody's all excited about that. Like, wow, this, well, they're kind of like doing the same thing with wrestling. Impact versus Lucha Underground, you know, Impact versus Triple A or whatever they do. That's kind of like a hot. That's that's that, that's what they're doing is is they're identifying with pop culture today, and what what's hot in pop culture is what you kind of go with. And I think that is a good. I think that is a very intelligent business plan for for them to use. You know, instead of like sticking to the, like the old school principles of professional wrestling. You know, yes. like everybody, the, the red wrestling's changed. You know, like I said back back in '92 when I broke in, I didn't know what the sheets were. I didn't know how they did it. I knew they talked on TV to each other, but I never know what they're saying. I didn't know what the holds. I didn't know the moves. But today, in professional wrestling, everybody knows the work. Everybody knows the work. So it's a different business model. So if everybody knows the work, why can't you just? Why can't you do things like that? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And your little feud with Don Callis is that a work or is that uh... kind of a shoot? It's, it's kind of half half work, half shoot. I think as it started with. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I, I definitely don't hate the guy or nothing. You know what I'm saying? And uh, when we, I, I think it started where uh, I kind of called him out on something he said on the show, and it took him off guard. And so it, uh, 
it created a thing where he kind of like had to like not to compromise himself he kind of had to turn it into into a shoot and neither of us are relenting Right. So it's like you know, it's like hey, I'm not that I know I know what happened, you know. So like, and he's like trying to. It's, the, we're we're trying to tell a tale of two histories, and they're different, but one of us knows the truth, and the other one, both of us know the truth, but, but one of us is acting like it's not. I see. All right. So, <laughs> so that that that's how it is. And I saw a picture of you with uh, Ted Hart and Chris Jericho uh, recently, and I was wondering your opinion on those two. Teddy Hart is just, uh, Teddy Hart's like my favorite uh, favorite guest on the podcast because he's just he tells the stories, and the, the, it's one sentence. <laughs> it's like he could he could talk the guy could talk for three hours, and it's like one sentence with like ten different stories, and it's just it's it's, it's, it's as entertaining as can be. You know, and uh, and me and Chris, um, you know, we had, we hadn't connected in, in, in years. You know, on the podcast, I saw him at the show in in uh, in Vegas, and um, you know, you just you just recon you reconnect with people you used to spend like like years with. You know, and uh, and plus, I, I you know, I, I introduced Chris to his wife years ago, so I'll always have that thing like you know, like with him, like a kind of like a. But I, I joke because because he wrote it, you know. He wrote in his book, uh, he called me a dweeb in one of them. <laughs> said you could go find disco at the soup kitchen. But it's like, you know, I think it's just, it's funny, but I make it sound like, you know, like we, we can make a good storyline out of that. You know what yeah. I'm saying? So. And for Ted, do you think that he'll ever get like another shot? Like a I don't know, man. He's got, he's an entertaining guy, yeah. you know? He's a, he's a crazy in-ring character. Um, he he's got a lot of heat from guys, but I'm, I've never had an issue with the guy. Um, I've always been thought he was really entertaining. Will he get another chance? Probably not. But he'll get you know I'm probably not WWE, but he'll he'll definitely he can definitely work. He's got a fan base, and he's this quirky guy. He's just, he's he's just, <laughs> he's a quirky guy. Man. He he wears his these weird outfits. Like he he would he would he would bring his wrestling gear right, and it's kind of like weird funky outfits. Kind of like what do I not what what I would wear, but just theoretically speaking, like if I was if I was in my disco character and I changed clothes three times during the day and brought it and just walked around the locker with a different outfit, right. that that's what Teddy would do. He just like <laughs> say, like, "What are you doing?" Dude? It's like you know, just like it's like a fashion model backstage before the show working the boys, but it's like you know, it's like, dude, what, what are, there's no fans here. You know, it's like, what, are, what, what are you doing? Here? <laughs> uh, he's great. And was it uh, Cody Rhodes that you had some sort of issue with recently on Twitter? Well, well Cody Rhodes, well, here's the thing. You, you, I don't, you, if you've listened to any, any of the stuff I've done, I'm, I'm very big because I see wrestling today. And the, with social media and Twitter, what I find very disturbing is, is people retweet these, these videos of wrestlers killing each other and doing really dangerous stuff and doing risky stuff and stuff that you can get crippled doing. And you look at the comments, and everybody's like, "Oh, well, you know, everybody's high five." You know, eighty percent of the comments are like, "Wow, this is incredible," you know, stuff. And I'm like, "This is just a dangerous path," you know, that, that that we're going down. Like, guys are not guys think it's okay to be rougher with each other instead of working more with each other. Yeah. And I see guys kill each other all the time and stuff, and I, I'd, uh, then they go on social media and thank each other for the match. Bro, I was like, I was like, I go, somebody like, here's the thing. Everybody talked about like, a, they couldn't believe Brock Lesnar punched Braun. I was like, you know, I mean, they're all no, all due respect to Braun. Braun need Brock in the side of the face first. Back in the day, that's what you did. If you gave the guy a receipt, you know, if you need me, it's like, Jesus Christ, settle down. You know, and then that's it. Then we, we keep working from them. But then like, everybody thought, well, that was like, this big, oh my God, it's like, well, that's what you're supposed to do. When a guy's getting too rough, you don't embrace it. You tell the guy to like, you know, lighten up in there. I don't want to get hurt. You know what I'm saying? So the, there's like a different culture now where, where it's like pro wrestling fans all know it's a work. So when they, so they kind of, to pop them, the, these people that all know it's a work, to pop them, they feel you have to go out and like do, do some stuff that, that hurts for real during the match. Like a, 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 a power bump on the apron, or a pile driver on the apron, or something. You know, stuff like that. Like, it's like, what are you guys doing? You know, it's like the, the, yeah. you, you can't. You know, so so Cody had gotten busted open, right? 
And I was like, okay, Jesus Christ, like, dude, that's like, I tweeted, like, people retweet these things to me all the time. I, I, I saw it, so I just retweeted, like, well, nobody has, knows how to work anymore. All they want to do is try to get an ounce of five stars. It's ridiculous. It's like, I, you know, Cody thought I was burying him. Not burying him, he's the guy that got busted open. I'm like, I'm burying the guy that did this to you, you know, so, but it got completely mis misconstrued. Cody thought I was burying him. And Cody said some mean things about me and everything, but bro, I, I, this is one thing. If anybody knows me, I got thick skin. I'm like, you know, you got, I get, I've got, like on Twitter, I've got 97% real followers, and I've only blocked one guy in my entire life. So my timeline is filled with people trying to insult me and stuff, and I don't, I, I laugh at it, you know what I'm saying? So a guy buries me, he's like, and I was like, that just said, if Cody thought I was insulting him, okay, I have no problem with him, you know, burying me, that's no big deal, but like, I think if he really, if I if he had a conversation, told me, hey, I'm not burying you, I'm just burying the other guy. Yeah. He, he probably wouldn't have reacted the same way, you know, but it's no big deal. It's just, it just happened. But that's social media these days. People see stuff like that and that's, that's news. Yeah. You know, it's like your social, like when you're a wrestler today, your social media account is newsworthy. You know, especially Cody's. Cody's is hysterical. You know, <laughs> he's like, he's tweeting funny stuff all the time. But, uh, but yeah, I'm just, I'm just big on the, 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 the path that wrestling is going where guys are just like, we know what concussions causes concussions. And it's like guys kind of like it looks like they, they don't they don't know because they're still doing things. I'm like guys, you've seen the studies and stuff. <laughs> you, know, you know, like you know, like forearming each other in the side of the head. You know, if, if you're working it, that's fine. I go, but you screw one up. I go, what's what's the result of that? I go, if you if you screw up a forearm to the head and you hit the guy too hard, what can happen? You get a concussion. I go, I grew up. You, you know, throw work and like, like, like these days, like how often you see you got like professional wrestlers feed a feed a comeback in a hot tag, where the guy hits the ring, he's punch, you know, punch, punch. Nobody don't has that. Nobody has that skill anymore. Yeah. You know, and I, there's the skills I grew up watching, and we weren't killing each other out there. You know, we were. We I don't, I've been doing this 26 years. I've never hurt anybody. I've never hurt one guy, not one time. I'm like, and these guys are hurting each other all. They're they're. It's like wrestlers when they got hurt, you hurt your shoulder, you hurt your knee. You hurt your back, you hurt your hips, but these guys are like hurting each other, yeah. you know, like with a move. And I'm like, God Almighty, it's like, shh, it's not what this is all about, you know. It's not what it's supposed to be all about, you know. And what do you think about WWE's recent thing at WrestleMania with the uh, fourth grader winning the tag title? And I guess now he's going to be a recurring character. I don't know. If well, I can't, here's what I think: it's, it's if <laughs> they do stuff like that. And it's like, it's like, guys, don't you realize that like everybody knows that this is a work? And like, I mean, how long did it take for them to, to the, for the fans to find out that it was one of the referee's sons? So it's like, it's not like, this, like a storyline like that has has zero depth because as soon as they find out the kid's a plant, it's like the, the angle's over. You know, it's like, so what, what are you, you going to do with that? You know what I'm saying? It's like, you can't do stuff like that these days because everybody knows it's a work. And it's like, maybe you pop people in the moment. I go, but that's not a WrestleMania moment that you're gonna remember because like, oh, that, that that kid was a work, you know. I saw, I thought it was that, that's the way I looked at it, you know. As soon as everybody knows that the kid's a fa a plant, what, you know, it's like it's, what, what are you gonna do with it, right? Yeah. yeah. And overall, I guess mainstream interest in uh, the television products now is is down. Um, what would you do as a as a guy that's booked for some major companies um, differently? I don't know, but I don't know what you can do, because the style of work today is um, is a uh, is too acrobatic for what professional wrestling is trying to sell. You know, we grew up like I said, like it's it's evolved from people thinking they were fighting for real to people suspending the, their disbelief to thinking they were fighting for real to now people don't have any suspension disbelief at all because everybody knows the work. Everybody knows the work. And literally, people that can that have never worked before ever think they know more about work than the people that have worked. Yeah. You know, and it's like so when you you have that culture that's infested the business, it's like what can you do to change to tell guys, hey, you know, this this this, this style of wrestling is you, we're doing it wrong because this is this this looks like a, a circus. I mean, you watch if you watch Cirque du Soleil, you watch this. This is what the guys do in Cirque du Soleil. This is not what the guys do in fights. And you want to sell fights to people cutting promos, talking about, like I've always said, it's like, like I see a lot of the stuff that guys, how the guys wrestle today, and I've always said, like, how, how do you write promos for that? If that's what you're going to go do out there. Yeah. You know, it's like, it used to be from Dusty Rhodes and Ric Flair talking about going and kick each other's ass. 
Stone Cold and Rock talking about killed each other, beating each other, you know, beating each other up. It's like, what, what, are, what are these guys going to do to do all these acrobatics? What are, what are you going to say to to promote your match against getting people come watch? Yeah. And like this whole thing, like everybody's like, uh, uh, like wrestling is art. Now this, like, who's why are people embracing that? Who wants to go to watch? Who wants to go watch? If I'm telling you, who wants to go watch two perform two performing art two artists t- trying to simulate a competition against each other where they're doing acrobatics, as opposed to watching Bill Goldberg fight Brock Lesnar? Yeah, you know, it's, it's all like it, that so that's what I'm saying. So it's like you know the, the model of wrestling has just gone so far off the map that like that, that's why people do, I, I, you could tell say it's creative. You know, and like it's, it's a creative, but it all to me starts with what the guys are doing in the ring. How are creative supposed to write for guys that are doing that? If if everybody knows it's the work and they know it's acrobatic and you're diving all over each other and stuff, what what, what are you going to say? That if you're not even going to talk about beating each other up or going out there and try to beat each other up. Yeah. So I would just try to change the culture. I try to teach old school, you know, like like wrestling, like like perfect example, like like a guy like I've been training Stefan Bonner, right? <clears throat> And I've been with him in a few weeks, a couple of months, because I've been for my job. But like yeah. when I train him, I say I want to train you to look like a UFC fighter that's going in there beat people up. I don't want to train you to be a professional wrestler. I want to train you to go in there and look like you're still doing UFC, but you're working. You're you know you're not hurting the guy, and that's it. And like if you look, that's what P fans. When when a fan comes and watches a show, matches like that, your suspension disbelief changes. You know what I'm saying? It's in the it's in the right place because like okay, this guy's fighting. You know what I'm saying? So like guys like Goldberg, Brock, you know, like Stefan Bonner and stuff. And then when they go out there, it's like, hey, this guy's coming to go. He's coming to, to to mess some people up. You know, which is what it should look like. And if you look, those are the people that are really over, right. not the people the, the people that are, the people think are over that are good workers and stuff. And they're over with the, the, you know this crowd. The I go niche. the small niche audience, you know, this, 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 this subculture of this is awesome fans yeah. that just that, that know it's a work. They want you to go out there and risk something, and then they'll chant this is awesome if you successfully perform it. You know what I'm saying? If you if you don't, you know, say they, they want to see guys kill each other, but the guys aren't killing each other, make it look like they're killing each other like Brock and Goldberg are. They're killing each other doing something where you can land on your neck and break your neck. You know, it's just like that yeah. you're doing that to we kill each other. So I was like, I don't know, you know. So I actually saw a Quebecer Pierre who wrestles for our company do like a, a moonsault to the outside that clearly looked like the guys were trying to catch him. Right. Didn't even look like he was trying to hurt yeah. them. And at his age doing that, I asked him, are you insane? Yeah, why are you doing that? To get a This Is Awesome chant from the city? Because there's a million people that do that. And like, you know, and that's the thing. Like, if, if guys, if you're going to do all that stuff where it looks like you're cooperating with each other try to hide it more they're not hiding it it looks like this one guy's helping the other guy do this it looks like you're standing there waiting for the guy to jump on you and i'm like yeah it's or funny I, running towards the guy to catch him. right and so the, the guy's standing there you run all the way across the ring run all the way back and the guy's standing you dive over and the guy didn't move it's like it's funny whenever i, I work not that much if every guy wants to tell me hey uh you know i'm gonna do a thing i say yeah my character would move out of the way <laughs> so, so if you want to dive over the top and land on the floor go ahead because yeah. my, because I think that would get a better pop than like, you know, than like dude just standing there like this and catching you, you know. So, but I would, I would. There's nothing creative can be done until the guys start embracing the ver, start embracing the, the verbal skills required to get people to come and watch you wrestle. Because as I said it before and say again, and show me in history where a five star match uh, drew money. Okay, five star matches never draw money. The match was drawn, the money was drawn before the match takes place. So people do not they need to embrace the skills to draw the fans first. Whatever happens after that, you can say like, you know, that, that's that's not, the, the five-star match didn't, you know, the fans didn't pay for the five-star match. The fans, you know, the five-star match happened after they paid. Right. And when people start realizing that, that you have to give to do the things to get people to come watch you wrestle, you know? It's because if you don't have a five star match, you didn't a five star match didn't draw. You know, what I'm like, so, so that's 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 why I always help people. So the, the, all the money's drawn before the match starts. You got to be able to talk, and good talkers will always be able to make make money in this business, and not have to kill themselves. You know. Now, for your social media, for anyone watching this that wants to follow you on your Twitter or, or Facebook, at the real disco on Twitter. Uh, I don't like. Uh, I get. 
I've got 900 friend requests from wrestling fans trying to be my friend on Facebook. If I don't know you, I'm not, I'm not, you're not my friend on Facebook. I'm not, I'm, not adding, I'm not adding you if I don't know you. You're either gonna be a hot girl or a friend of mine personally. So for Facebook, if you want to follow me on Twitter, go ahead. But I'm not. You're not gonna have my Facebook page. <laughs> I did that one time. I let a wrestling fan on my Facebook page, and the first thing he did was post a video of me wrestling Goldberg. I'm like, <laughs> dude, I was. It's like who cares, you know? I was like, oh, oh yeah, yeah, I know I wrestle Goldberg, you know. Um, you can catch me at Disco Master GG on Twitter. Um, Keeping 100 podcast with Conan. Uh, this uh, drops on late Wednesday nights, early Thursday mornings on Westwood One. And I do a, a podcast on the Russo brand called Lions, Tigers, Bears, and Disco. It's on Fridays on the Realm Network. And um, we recap news of the week. So, and uh, that's where you can catch me. And is there any uh, final thought you want to give the people that ended up watching this uh, very extended interview? <laughs> um, yeah, that if uh, if if you want to see some, if if you're a fan of professional wrestling, I would tell you to go back and watch um, go, get get the WWE Network and go watch some of the stuff from from the mid to late '90s and just watch how the the crowd responds to the shows back then and the way they do now. And I think you're you in It'd be an impressive thing for you for you to like see to see how what what wrestling has has evol- evolved into as to what it was. So. Very good. And can you give us a, a disco move to end this off? Sure thing. Do you want me to like that? One moment. I'll do it from here. Here we go. <laughs> That's all I want. Yeah, this one, right? <laughs> oh man. <laughs>